Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious with Mark Poles. I just finished a three and a half hour conversation with Jeremy Lasman. He's the founder of The Passion Company. You can find it at thepassioncompany.org. We had a very deep, nuanced conversation. My head's still buzzing. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed being part of it. Here it is. Thanks. Take care. So we don't know each other. We've never met. Uh, Amber reached out through uh, matchmaker.fm, which sounds like a dating profile site, but uh, it's the strangest name. But um, if there's anything you want me to remove after, feel free to just let me know. Uh, you know, put a timestamp on it. Oh, I missed that something, I guess. I love long format. It allows us to get nuanced. Um, I listened to your hour. It was two half hours with the British gentleman okay. in August. I guess he put it out in August. So um every answer that you give me will probably open 15 questions not really answer my question so it's one of those not not to be combative it's like uh tell me where you're at and i like to kind of unwind that because i have a lot of thoughts and i have some interesting things because i'm curious about your history and how you got where you got let's do this so welcome to knocked conscious could i ask you if you may i'm sure you're sending us out on some kind of tour but how did you and or amber come across uh my show i guess or how did what compelled you to maybe reach out unless you're just kind of blasting a couple people uh no it's it's uh we're on the lookout for um podcasts where i can get the message out on on what i'm doing and uh you had mentioned the matchmaker um it's a that's just been a, a really good way to connect and kind of get through the noise of um you know, you, you know, the other person is wanting find great guests and you're looking to find great shows and, and there it's uh, not a lot of fluff like uh, LinkedIn and like a lot, a lot of extra noise on there. So, um, yeah, we've been using Matchmaker and glad we were able to uh, find you. I love yeah, that your podcast, by the way, not conscious. Yeah, I'm happy to get into that. So um, yeah. but I'm but I'm more curious about you, obviously, because I, I come here when I. I don't generally uh, res- respond to everyone on knock uh, on the matchmaker site. Okay. If someone does, I'll st- definitely respond or say no, thank you. Or you know, there's a lot of that. I don't often do this, but when uh, Amber reached out, something just pinged. I, I listened to that podcast, like I mentioned, and it just sounded like a good fit. So we could start anywhere you want. Um, we could just do a quick brush of like a bio history um, to you know up into the probably the SpaceX thing, brush over through that and then go through where you're at and how we're yeah. getting there. Uh, you lead you lead it off, man. Your curiosity right. is well, king. Right well, now. Let's do it. Okay. So you're I think you I, I don't want to say your age. Can I say your age from what I researched? Sure. If I'm okay, 35, is that mm-hmm. correct? Okay. Share birthday with Einstein. That would and then I looked that up because I'm a geek, so I need to look that up, obviously. March 14th, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Great. Hi Dave. <laughs> Yeah, pie. yeah, imagine 2015. That would have been great. Um, or actually in, what was it, in 1514, I guess. 2.1, 3.1415, right? Yeah. 1529. So I guess 1529 would have been the yeah. best. March 14th, 1529 would have been the best date to be born. Is that sound about right? Probably. <laughs> so um, you're born, and I know very little bit, but I kind of glance over what your childhood was like so tell me about your childhood because your childhood and your adulthood sound very different and very similar to probably similar to something i kind of went through so i'm curious yeah yeah so um i'm an only child uh so definitely um definitely you know uh, didn't have that uh, brother or sister uh, experience small family um and man uh yeah, when you when you say the the evolution there, the transformation, it's it's wild uh, to to go back there and and feel just yeah the I was I was a very quiet and introverted, um, shy uh, and and highly sensitive, but I didn't I didn't know and neither did like my parents have the uh, equipped uh ness to kind of know what that meant uh especially uh 
years back, um, prior, you know, kind of uh, prior to like a, a lot of that has changed in society right now with with how uh, children are. Um, so I, I was highly sensitive, but in an energetic way that I, I didn't know or was equipped to understand. And so I was very much, cons you know, bombarded by a lot of um, environmental people, emotional and emp empathetic data uh, in my environment and in school and all of that. So that I think definitely distracted me, but also gave me the the juice for my freedom and mastery of 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 what that meant once I became aware or you know knocked conscious uh, uh, from from being kind of um, imprisoned by just uh, overthinking and h highly sensitive to just data and information and and processing and and trying to understand things and um, so that definitely gave me the impetus for you know my personal development journey uh, kind of after college. I, I had um, I really didn't like school uh, growing up. I don't I, did, were you the same way or did you enjoy school? It, it's odd, but I, I excelled, but I it's very odd because I was probably an intro, I was extrovert and introvert. So I was I was able to come to forge relationships, but didn't feel right in any of them. Yeah. So I, I was able to blend in. Not, it's really hard to explain. I think I was actually two different people, to be honest with you. If I, if I, were, if I were to be honest with you, we might get into that a little later. Um, but uh, I had a different childhood. Um, if I may go back to your childhood, do you have an anecdotal story of a highly sensitive? Because that certainly definitely aligns with that input of information. And I understand I, I've had it myself. You walk into a room and your mood changes because you feel the mood of the room. Yeah. I mean, it happens in general in a big sense, like at a comedy show or at a concert. Those are high, those are general, but those are just such mass experiences that humans just get into. But sometimes, to your point, there are some people who get higher doses of that or more concentrations at lower levels, like on a one-on-one -on -one level. Yeah. I think, you know, put it anecdotally I think the best way to kind of wrap it is it because of the you know uh attention to which I was raised like it really kind of oops it kind of led itself to just uh, kind of being a people pleaser uh so I, I knew how to feel other people's emotions um and know uh, it's similar to what you were saying like kind of know how to act so that they can be pleased with me um, and know when I was, you know, hitting, you know, landmines of sort and know how to just using all the energy to kind of like please whoever I was with because that just allowed me to feel safe uh, by, you know, using my empathy and the, the sensitivity that way. But I kind of made myself invisible uh, because of that and uh, kind of a low self worth, uh, insecure, um, wasn't really truly able to express myself um, until way later on uh, when when I actually realized like, oh, I have a voice, like I'm allowed yeah. to allowed to speak, you know, but that happened pretty late later on. Uh, but I, I would say it's that mix of, of people pleaser and then just like a deep seated rebellion against everything i mean against authority against school you know being locked into a desk all day like i was just so intelligent to the man this is this is not the way it should be if i if it was up to me uh but i don't have a voice so it's not up to me i have to please my parents i have to you know please the teachers but like in the background was like re rebelliousness you know uh bending bending the rules i mean like as much as you can right so yeah. we can get away with yeah not but not like overtly break like i wasn't a bad kid I, I right was... but, but i know what you mean like testing the waters like testing the fence right you're you're yeah. seeing where just more in a weird way you're probably messing with people 
seeing where you can get away with stuff just to see it because you're bored and you your brain's just going a mile a minute exactly exactly spot on yeah yeah i definitely know like i was better in school but it was more it wasn't consciously done it was literally i could sit there have a conversation in the back of the room and the teacher would call me and ask me what she just said and i would verbatim read it back like verbatim say it back and she'd get mad at me because i was able to do that yeah. so current not challenges at all but my girlfriend i can talk at her and she could talk to me while i'm talking i could both talk and listen it sounds like weird but i have this ability to kind of be able to take in information as i'm speaking because it's all one to me it all kind of flows wow. together but i'm sure i don't do it well i'm sure the multitasking is not so good as i think but i tend to think i i think i listen okay but I don't know, maybe she'll argue that, but okay. So as a child then at what, um, so I would have probably been a type of person to discover, actually find you out as a friend. I would have, I would have found you out and befriended you. We would have probably hung out. And I know that sounds very odd, but I was one of these people that I didn't care what, who, who people were. I didn't like, there was no, so there was no status for me. It's just whether people interested me or not. So if I were interested, I would be like, you sound like an okay person. Let's go. Like, what do you, what do you got? So I'm sorry that you kind of went through that. Did you have a few friends or a couple close friends or? Oh or, yeah. Uh, oh, how yeah. would you? Yeah. I had a, um, a tight knit group of, of friends, um, kind of on the outskirts of the social, uh, you know, played a lot of sports, uh, during lunches and basically everything to kind of stay away from, uh, any attention or, uh, you know, social, <laughs> um, awkwardness uh but uh yeah they i i still have those friends to this day and then yeah um later on it was it, I, I definitely could fit in with any group um but you know i i definitely wasn't putting myself out there uh in any capacity uh until i started to kind of experiment with like acting and um some stage things but yeah okay i, I love so behind, behind the scenes i, I fell in love with editing <laughs> Okay, so on that front, you actually are the Jeremy Lasman in the IMDb as an actor. Are you? Yes. Okay, so I I didn't even look at that because I had, obviously it was just a quick connection and I didn't get to look everything up. So tell me about that. When did the acting? When was the first bug hit? When did you say, "Hey, I think this is something"? Was it something your parents pushed you toward, or was it something? Oh that... no, 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 <laughs> uh, no. It was okay. So my love for film started. You know, well, like kind of the getting into the back backstage or uh, production side of things happened in sixth or seventh grade when I was introduced to video editing um, and the art of it. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a video, like a new pr video production class um, where I got to learn, you know, how it's done and, and the timeline and uh, just the craft of editing and that I fell in love with because a it was something to like really immerse myself into passion wise and then b it was a way to kind of tune out the rest of the world uh, and and just get sucked into um, into uh, that creativity uh, of of thinking about timelines and and editing splitting and everything that makes a like good editing and and just what you can do with that um i kind of really fell in love with and then just cinema in general um i'm not a a, a cinephile on the level of like you know tarantino uh where i know every single genre right. and every single movie uh uh but no I, I i love i love films i consider myself a cinephile maybe not with the broadest of uh of knowledge um but like Kubrick is my favorite director. Okay, perfect. Um, I was going to ask, what would you describe as probably one of your most visually stunning movies if you were? And I would, if you said Kubrick, I would guess 2001, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically. Uh, also, huge. Clockwork Orange is a phenomenal. Clockwork Orange fan. Might be even above that. It's, just it's a better movie. movie. It's a yeah. better movie. It's just visually 2001. It was, how, <laughs> how else could we have landed on the moon without his help, right? They had not, <laughs> not seen <laughs> Earth until then. Yeah, I, I, I can gush about that uh, forever. Um, we can talk about that for sure. Yeah, and then we, I'm sure we'll get into pro wrestling too. But um, the, I got the Andre the Giant shirt. 
like that. Oh, nice, nice. I didn't yeah. Roots of Fight dot com. Go, yeah, go check it out. Worth it. So I did my own, you know, editing little things like that. Uh, my first, I guess, foray into acting. Uh, I don't know if you did video projects and classes like Spanish video projects or uh, English projects, but we got to do videos. Uh, so doing like video parodies of Macbeth, uh, for oh, cool. S- Spanish class, we did a star Wars where I learned how to do rotoscoping for lightsabers and I was in it as well. Um, but so that was like my first acting. Um, and then, uh, and that's, I would guess, what's that 2000 then? Is that right around that time? Uh, 2002. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Mid- Cause I'm old already at that point. So Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So video, it was the video part of it or the creation behind the scenes almost. The production of said video that you do see is how was that made or how did you do that? Yeah. So versus like computer tech versus it wasn't a computer side. It was more of a video side, like a more of a movie video type side. Movie video. I mean, I, I did have a. Uh, I built my own computers, so that, better okay. Was... That's what I. That's what I was asking. That's kind of good. There. Yeah. Still have a bunch built in my ba- in my closet here that I hand built. You know. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. They I was a hardware guy. I can build them. I had, always had a hardware problem with the software. That was always my issue. Drivers and whatnot. So, but yeah. I come. I'm 15 years older, so almost 15 years old. So, I had a little bit more of the hands hands on drivers not working so well versus plug and play and. All the good oh, stuff, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, the jumper switches, all the good stuff. Anyway, <laughs> could talk about that for hours. All right, yeah. so video, you you get yeah. to make these parody videos, and you're like, oh, this is great. Now, did you enjoy both being in front of the camera and behind at this time, or not yet? No, it, it was still very awkward and shy uh, in front of the camera. It wasn't until so that was your means to be behind the camera was. You, yeah. you made yourself the subject, not because you wanted to be the subject, but because that was the way to be able to produce a movie because you're going right. to be in it. Right. And it, it was a little fun on that side, too, especially for the, uh, I'm sure. the yeah. class ones where it's like, yeah, like for the Spanish, like we didn't even do costumes, but we were doing Star, you know, Star Wars uh, lightsaber fights. And that's fun. And then I did martial arts. I did a judo and Aikido growing up. So I actually, now that I remember, like my favorite part was doing the stunts, like in front of the camera, like doing rolls and flips and, uh, you know, putting my body on the line uh, for the shot that I, I very much enjoyed, you know, uh, hurting myself for for the laugh. <laughs> OK, a little Michael Richards in you is what yeah. you have. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun. I mean, that would probably bring your affinity towards wrestling then. I mean, did you grow up? Just kind of always liking that. I mean, as a single child, it seems interesting. Like, I, I have a brother three years older. We're close, but we're not close. It's one of those, you know, we, we grew up together and everything, but we're just different people, but we're totally fine with each other. We're just different. Yeah. But being completely single or solo must be a very different experience. Is that how you were able to occupy yourself, is to do those kinds of things, like watch TV or... or... Yeah, I mean... Definitely, there. Uh, I still, still to this day, have a very active inner world. Um, you know that that definitely uh, keeps you oc- occupied, especially when you have all the, like what we were talking about, the games of of like what can I get away with in life uh, underneath the radar, and and you know um, the, all those games that you occupy yourself with. Um, but yeah, like. Uh, I think baseball and, and pro wrestling and, and movies definitely fill that that side of myself. Um, okay. And you grew up in California? Uh, yes. I was born okay. in Colorado, but moved to California when I was really young. So baseball would have been, would have been I guess, the Dodgers and Anaheim, or who would have that have been in, in your baseball that you really – Yeah, it should have been the for. Dodgers, uh, but no. <laughs> I was uh, actually a big Atlanta Braves fan back when they had the three – you know, best pitchers. Uh, yeah. They had Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz. And uh, that's because uh, Maddox was my favorite pitcher because I was like him. I couldn't throw that fast, uh, but I could I could get it in a spot and, and be accurate, right? Like that was his game was just yep. being a mechanic. Um, so I definitely fell in love with that. Uh, so the Braves were kind of my team by proxy of, of who my favorite was. 
Very nice. Yeah, yeah. and I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting because I, I grew up in Philadelphia, so I had a lot of sports stuff connected to that, of course. But, but I moved to Arizona, and it's funny because the Braves and the Cubs, I think, are the two teams because that's the only television channel. They had TBS oh. and C, you know, CBN, which is the Chicago network or something, CWN or something. Yeah. And those are the only two they had out here before they had professional sports. They're watching, you know, out of out of state teams. So obviously Colorado would have had that before the Rockies as well. Right. So interesting. You, so you baseball, wrestling. Too? I'm sorry. You used to watch baseball too? I I grew up with baseball. I grew up with Harry Callis as a voice of, of sports. So he had that beautiful draw, but it's a picnic game. And I grew up playing sports. Mm. I grew up playing baseball, actually. I was a third baseman. And I got in a really bad car accident uh, when I was 13, and it kind of ended that. But oh. uh, I got more into hockey and football. I was always a hockey enthusiast because of, I guess, the East Coast, Philadelphia, you know, bleeding and hitting each other over the head with sticks sounds like a fun thing. Yeah. But uh, that's how we did it. So <laughs> we had a lot of like, to your point, everything was sports, neighborhood sports. We play like, oh, if there's a basketball quarter, or, like just, we just need a backboard. Yeah. You know, we play in a church or we just pull, you know, pull out the nets and play hockey or That'd anything. Soccer. Yeah. Anything you play. Right. Yeah. So excellent. So wrestling, tell, yeah. tell me about your, your earliest memory of a, of a wrestling uh, event or something, something you can, call back on yeah well wrestling was always the constant uh through thick and thin high highs and lows it was it was it was there all it was always there and um you know i i went to a event at the anaheim arrowhead pond went back when it was the arrowhead pond in anaheim um a house show there I've been to a few WrestleManias, uh, WrestleMania 21, which was in Hollywood, uh, Staples Center. I went to that live, incredible. Um, but uh, with with wrestling, what I started to really immerse myself in and, and why I have a, a deep passion for it is that it, the form of entertainment and sports that it blurs and blends um in amazing ways that you you i somewhere i have a, a book in me uh that you know i have some notes down but like of of how pro wrestling taught me the meaning of life uh because it so blurs reality and fiction together to where you don't know what's real and what's unreal that it's almost more real than real life when you're like when it's done so, so, so masterfully well, uh, there's nothing else like it uh, on the planet, as far as I'm concerned, when it's when it's done uh, by two expert craftsmen uh, of, of their artistry. Um, and uh, you, it, it just taught me so much, especially when I learned more of the behind the scenes, um, you know, language and, and the inner workings and the, uh behind the veil of of like how they communicate with each other the just the fact that they're dancing with each other both make like the goal is to make each other look better through you looking bad or like it it just the chemistry the everything about it in the art and the science it's just such a a microcosm of life that you can learn so much from uh i don't know i don't know if a lot of people look at it as deep as i do but um it, it certainly gave me so much in in becoming conscious and 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 looking at my own artistry and and uh the the craft that i bring with my work and um dancing with someone on a, on a podcast like this where we are battling in that sense of like taking each other to places and challenging each other. And um, so I, I've just learned so much from it. And it was just always this constant that even in the shittiest of, of you know, parents getting divorced or just school draining the hell out of me, like it was always there for me. Like, and uh, every Monday, every Friday. every And then pay-per-views. Yeah. And Saturdays and pay-per-views. Yeah. It was, yeah. I remember Saturday morning cartoons and everything. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, in lay terms, it is a man soap opera. 
That's yes. a lay term. But to your point, it's way deeper than that. I mean, to watch a craftsman just hone the du- duality, the duplicity of people from good to bad, from good guy to heal, whatever, and then back again and just watch the people just fall right into it. And some it's don't buy it. Some, some, and if it's not done properly, it it doesn't work. Like, I don't know if you watch it currently. Do you watch it yes. currently? Okay, so let's use L.A. Knight as a perfect example, okay. right? All right. Randy Macho Man 2.0, whatever you want to call him. You can call him Eli's brother, right? Whatever. Yeah. Um, whatever you want to call I don't know what you want to call I mean, I, it's funny. The guy just took off, and the pop happened. And I can't explain it, but I watched it happen. And I'm, I'm not I'm – not, frustrated that it happened i'm so happy for him that is i'm trying to understand how him not someone else for example and this guy is just different he he somehow captures everything the way one should he just captures your complete attention attention yeah and remember they brought him in with the max dupree thing and it was a complete and they brought him in like that and i you could tell right you probably saw the same thing. You're like, what is this? What are they doing with him? Especially after seeing him on NXT where he was more LA night. Where he was who he was, right? And it's yeah. like, really? The, I mean, I've seen it happen where they try to play with these things. But I'm like, who had that creative decision? Yeah. And those guys are extremely creative. Vince McMahon is highly creative with his business. But it does make you wonder, like, where did they take this stab? And where did they think that was going to work? Because the woman who left whatever is with the A team, right? Alpha, whatever, Alpha Academy. She's doing great on her own. And it's like, okay. it really works this way. And how that, how they were able to pivot and actually make two very big successes out of one major failure, basically, is yeah. very interesting in, in a less than a year, six months a year, you know? Yeah. Oh, oh so much to say there. Like, <laughs> please. Well, like, <laughs> first off, he's a, uh, I, you know, I know this is a, a, a cinema term, but like journeyman, like he built himself 40. 20 years. I uh, was it 15 years or something uh, prior to the WWE and NXT um, honing honing his thing. Um, so that's definitely a part of of like why it's overnight uh, is because he has been putting that 10,000 hours into his craft um and people feel that like the experience the expertise the artistry uh that connects that's what is the attention uh grabber um and you mentioned vince uh and he's a huge inspiration for sure uh because he is a mastermind um and it's so funny when when you look back on things like because you don't know, like, if that was a part of the master plan that, no, we're going to, we're going to, this is all a part of it. We're going to do this other gimmick to let you be this other person so that fans demand more. Like, you don't, we don't know if that was the plan. Like, do Good this. Points, like, uh, coming, to, coming like, in, clamor. almost underwhelming them and then re, re overwhelming them. Oh, like, that's, he's a long term master. He's a puppet master, right? Puppet like, master where it's like, did that actually help him do the, like, no, we want the one, like, we clamor for it, like, get that rise out of, no, we don't like this one that much. That's a good point. Change, like, so just to think on that level of the. Right, it is 40 chess. It really is. It's like, a, it is 40 chess for sure. Yeah, but I, I agree. It wasn't, it wasn't him, but like, right. maybe that was the point when you, cons- I know I'm kind of stretching the, you know. No, no, it's not. It's not the worst thing. Or maybe they thought he was just going to be so good that he could push through that and and rise up three other stars that they were bringing up along. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to to go through. I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of a lot of that. So, okay, so obviously you're into it even now. So, to to if you had a dream match, let's just throw it out there. Who would be your two people? Like and obviously, I would think you're the person who was love to watch them. I hate to say manipulate the audience, but they mold and shape and curate the audience in this beautiful dance that they can sh- with their words and they can just get you to do you know what or yeah. get you to you know finally or do whatever you can say. What what are your thoughts on on yeah. who that would be? 
Oof. We're talking like un, uh, not retired people. Yeah, we. I mean, we can go from people we know, right? I mean, like, yeah. I'll give you one. I would say Ric Flair would have to be in the conversation as a talker, just for the that. I mean, if we're that we a lot to pluck from from that uh, that crop. Um, <laughs> I, I was gonna say the most realistic right now in terms of like, holy shit, uh, sort of vibe, which they are. You know, I don't know if you saw Friday, but he came back. I think because the actor strike, The Rock came back. Yes, um, I watched that. You know, you know the Roman Reigns versus The Rock. I think is would be on epic proportions, like because it's almost almost impossible for it, but it also is kind of possible. Um, that is an excellent point. So, in terms of like, I'm trying to get as realistic with the, the dream match. Um, of like bear, you know, edge of he's, I don't know if he has another match. He probably has another match in him. Um, he could do one. Cause they did. I think he did say on the Pat McAfee that, uh, it was, a, they were going to do it last year at, at mania, but it didn't, didn't happen mm -hmm. um, for, for whatever reason. So I don't know if they're teasing, uh, but you know, big picture. So, that that's yeah. definitely the, the most star dream match i think yeah well because i think about some imposing char characters over the years like kane and undertaker were imposing but they weren't that they didn't work the mic like you could work a mic because they had you know the manager like paul you know paulie would be the manager or whatever it's or the you know the who's the guy the guy who guy with the pale guy with the mustache and but then it wasn't paulie crypt right paul wasn't it with the urn if uh, I remember correctly. Uh, oh man, not Paul Heyman. Um, no, 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 not Paul Heyman. Obviously, not the other. Anyway, what? Regardless, they, they always had like some kind of manager in that way, but they were just imposing characters. They never had the pop like a Rock, Steve Austin to that point. And it's kind of interesting to watch like an LA Knight kind of recapture that on the microphone because you don't hear that very often anymore. Right. They try, but they don't throwback, do that for sure. It is. It is throwback. So I think that's another yeah, it's reason why he's catching on like crazy. Yeah. Man, so you were slightly, slightly introverted, but could make for you easily could blend in. Sounds like you could kind of guess how people felt and what they wanted, and kind of blend it in with life. And your personal interests, passions, whatever we get to, didn't really start to get to express themselves until you got to college. Is that what you were saying? Well, it was spotty because. I, I definitely did get very immersed in things, like, but not consistently. Um, like down the rabbit hole for yeah. like short periods of time and a lot of different subjects. Yeah, yeah. And and the weird thing is, I, I don't know if I ever considered that to be my passions, uh, but I definitely, you know, got immersed and and um, taught taught myself new things when I got inspired to teach myself new things. Um, but the best way that I kind of consider it is the the mentality sadly eh, not really regretfully but like was it was just a, a monorail to graduating college because that's all like that was what I had to do to appease everyone else just get there and then you can start and then it'll happen right yeah. yeah um that was that was kind of the mindset that I had you know it, it wasn't yeah it, it's it just the way it, it's just the way it was where it was the destination bound and kind of a monorail and don't look out because you just got to do it and then you can uh kind of explore um but yeah it was towards the end of college where i started personal development uh, i started seeing a therapist um and just did started inner work uh i can remember barely being able to sit still for five minutes to meditate because my mind was just so noisy and active and like could like couldn't even do it for five minutes um but then working that muscle and and getting better at it uh and yeah it, that's when i started to really explode myself uh i that, I, w I would consider to really use the the uh, context of, of the name of this podcast, like, I wouldn't consider I was knocked conscious until 
probably 2011, 10, 11, 12. Like that range was when I was like exploded. Yeah. Okay. What do you mind giving me the age group just because I don't want to do the math? I'll be honest. I'm a little easy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like 20, 21, 22. Okay. So right out of college, basically. Yeah. Coming. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's talk therapy if you're cool with that. Okay. Because therapy seems to be very important. I don't want to say seems to be. That is a ridiculous statement I just made there. It is very important. I've had it as well. But 21. Did you have the means at that time because mental health wasn't the thing? You probably would have had to have some funds to be able to speak to someone at that time if you didn't have insurance or something like that. How did you get to the thought of needing mental or needing the therapist or not needing is not correct, but feeling that something wasn't right and then the means to do so and, and the courage to do so for yourself? It's a good question. Um, yeah, I told you, man. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't do things light, man. <laughs> yeah, there. I actually saw someone. So I was eight years old when my parents got divorced, and then they sent me to. Uh, I think it was. A, it must have been a therapist uh, to have someone to talk to, and I guess just to make sure I was okay uh, from an outside party. Um, so I had experience with it when I was younger in that sense of um, where I was sent. Uh, that sounded weird. Uh, no, no, I get it. I, get it. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't sent. The evaluation or whatever yeah. they have, whatever the heck they call it. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so I wasn't, you know, uh, ignorant to, to it. Um, trying to remember, I think I was just kind of at the edge of, of, how negative I felt about myself. Um, and I had a part-time job through college at SpaceX, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Uh, so that kind of gave me the means to um, be able to do therapy. And then it was actually my dad's therapist. Um, it was the same one that he was seeing um, at the time. And uh, so I don't know if it was a suggestion or an experiment uh, just to see, you know, probably, I think at that phase, it was probably around the idea of fixing myself uh, until I learned that this is not really the case, um, that you're not, I, I really learned, like, you're not really broken, there's nothing to fix. Uh, so, but that was prior to that realization. Uh, so it was probably- oh, I'm Familiar, yeah. Yeah, it was probably around that, like I'm gonna fix myself, uh, kind of, kind of thing. And and you're totally right. Like back then, back then. Uh, so it'd be 2008, 2009. From it, it sounds right. Is that correct? No, a little later than that. Oh. Uh, you were 87. You were born. 88. 88. Okay, so yeah, that would be oh 2000. Yeah, that would be 2009, right? 21. Yeah, 2010, 2010, 2010, 2011. Okay, 2010, yeah. 11. Okay, I'm yeah. just trying to do the time because I'm trying to. I'm I'm ma I'm not matching it with with my progress. Mine was much delayed because mm -hmm. I'm an earlier generation, but obviously, so I'm just kind of play it in how you know where you where you realized it because speaking about these types of things for especially for men is is big because um, we don't understand it and we're told not to. So right. obviously, we're getting more comfortable with it, but we're also getting the point where like we're victim we're like victims of it and that's the last thing we should be is we should just be vigilant of it not victims of it and you know it's a whole other thing that we can talk about it's nuance but um so 21 you what what's rock bottom for you at 21 that may that has you just is what your, your dad the conversation with dad or the comfort that you felt with his therapist for example or I mean, I know I'm digging deep, and I apologize, yeah. but you um, know, I definitely I'm, I'm here to here to share. So, yeah, take me a second to just uh, submerge in that. Like th around the the got the guise of of fixing myself, it was everything. I don't I don't think I was at rock bottom in comparative sense to how low uh, that could be for someone. 
but it was more not rock bottom but the edge of negativity just the edge of how little i thought of myself and inabilities to express myself or put myself out there or create from my heart uh it I, I think it came about as a as a guidance to have someone there while i was opening up to this new self-discovery um and and it was nice to have that sounding board uh like a non-judgmental zone uh to share because I didn't have anyone else to talk to or I didn't think I had anyone else to talk to about the things that would come up uncomfortably in 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 therapy that um I it's why I'm I don't consider it rock bottom but I think it was just a disconnection from my own pain or pleasure in the first place if that's right. if that makes sense yeah it's a good point and and the reason i ask it that way i, I say rock bottom it's a me more metaphorical because some people who go into aa need a motorcycle accident and they need to almost die to realize right that they've hit rock bottom right for me i set my rock bottom at a very higher bar than i think most people would set their rock bottom so when i realized it to me my rock bottoms i set them they're like fixed so if i hit that line it's like all warning signs for me so i knew when i hit whatever i hit i had to do something because it wasn't it wasn't going to work anymore for me but once again i set my sets higher or just i just set my own personal standard of rock bottom higher than someone who doesn't have their own personal self-control in that way it sounds to me like you had done that for yourself you just didn't really put it in those terms Right, right. You saw a trend away, losing grip, falling, whatever that term is, yeah. and had the means and were, was able to do this. So yeah. I want to touch really quickly on SpaceX. We're going to talk real quickly. I listened to this podcast with this other gentleman that you had. Mentioned your father kind of got into SpaceX. Let's cover nepotism really quickly because I want to do it. I know it sound, you sounded uncomfortable even having to kind of defend it because it's not doesn't need defense. <laughs> let's let's put it that way yeah some of us are very lucky to know other people or to be in families where we have the ability to get into an industry yes i had that i i my parents my mom had a catering business my mom is my mom at work at home but at work she was rita that's just how it worked so i'd love for you to just touch on it because i i, I think i'm with you on this is like i Call me privilege or whatever, but my parents, I'm a first generation American. My parents came from war torn Germany. They were born in 1940 and 1944. They wow. met here. My, my, my mom and her family escaped East Germany. I, I didn't struggle. I have no struggle. They struggled for me. I'm grateful for it. But for me to not continue that is, is does not pay homage to them, first of all. And secondly, on the nepotism front, it's bad when it's incompetence, right? Let's just kid, let's not kid ourselves. So I'd love for you to just just touch up on it, how you got into SpaceX. And sure. I'm, I I understand that it you connections are connections. That's why they happen, but you still have to earn your position once you're there. I can't even imagine what it would be like, number 110, I think you mentioned, with someone of the caliber of the person running it kind of right there. I, so just give me that intro and all that. And then we can just let that stuff go and move forward to where you went from there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, it's a great question um, because my dad was a like a senior mechanical designer. Uh, so uh, from, I think, you know, 40, 50 years of experience in the business and uh, self-taught every like he he was he didn't go to college. Uh, but everything that he did was self-taught and his own, you know, intelligence and, and uh, conceptual 3D ability without, you know, computer uh, is, is incredibly talented guy. Um, so 
they were definitely, you know, startup energy uh, about around my tail end of high school, early college, where um, it was a summer, I, I think just out of high school, um, he was able to get my foot in the door uh, in terms of interaction with the CIO, the chief information officer. Um, and, you know, beyond just ha like making the introduction and, you know, finding out that he needed help, right? Like he, for sure, he needed help and it wasn't necessarily the help of a full-time seasoned position. It was for the, the grunt work, right? Like right. the shit work right. that he didn't plug this before. router in, unplug that, get under this, right. plug this phone. I I'm with you. Exactly. So I was a gopher. Trust me. I, I was a gopher. I put, I would have 13 hour days and dry and put 300 miles on my car running from exactly. whatever to whatever. And it's like, I, how did I average 20 miles an hour over a 13 hour period, literally stopping everywhere, dropping this off, picking this up. And it's like, you know, it's kind of interesting how you do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so it was basically that conversation he knew where I was coming from, no experience, basically, uh, but I could hang with him in conversations about technology. Um, and he felt my passion for it. Uh, and I think he also came from, uh, what, what's the way of the cliche, like school of hard knocks, right? Like uh, that sort of vibe, right? Um, and so I guess he, he saw that uh, potential in me and that I could hang uh, with his intelligence and, and uh, you know, curious and, and self-teaching and um, on the job training kind of, I can hang with that. Uh, and so it was just the first opportunity, right? Like, I think that first yeah. summer, literally $8 an hour, uh, just, you know, just to be there and, and do the little work that I was doing. Um, and then you prove yourself, right? Like, if you don't prove yourself, you, you, you're not going to like get the opportunity or or further it. Um, I can't imagine you lasting very long there if you don't. You well, either stick out one way or another. Exactly. I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, just to, to, to I don't want to trump that in any way, but uh, I went to school at a place called Ember Riddle Aeronautical University and I have a pilot's degree. So I was well, going to be a flight instructor. I was getting paid eight dollars an hour to fly people around Philadelphia sightseeing. And that's only the engine running. I had <laughs> only the engine running does not count all the prep work to check the engine, check the plane, all that stuff. So I'm very familiar with the hard knocks in the beginning of how uh, how we start our lives. So, OK, so he saw something and, and you were able to have conversation. Did you have obviously a technical conversation? Did you ever have any casual or was that not even a thing? Was that not even a thing? I mean, he seems oh, like a fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm still person. friends friends with him to this day. Uh, he's he's up in San Francisco. Um, he's also a DJ too. One of my favorite. Uh, I love his his sets. Um, uh, but yeah, no, we we went for sushi lunches and got to know Very each cool. other. And uh, yeah, it, we we have a, a friendship to this day. That's great. That's great yeah. to know. So. Then you mentioned, obviously, I, I think I listened to the podcast because, like I said, I don't like to rehash things. I want to find out new things. I want to get to know you. That's the whole point is I love meeting people. I don't like knowing them as much, but I love meeting them. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's bad, bad pun, I guess. <laughs> but I think as a highly sensitive empath, I think you kind of understand what I mean. You kind of get a lot of information very quickly from people because the comfort and the understanding and you know how it is. So you had that point of kind of that was that pinch point hitting that speed of sound where you either had to push through it and blow up or you have to step away right mm -hmm. at this point you found out that was something that you should do is step away from that is that sound about right uh, i mean after are you talking about like after the few years that i was there yeah or? after the few years that you were there right you grew to a growth point right because i don't i don't want to delve too much into i mean unless you'd like to share some stories about that i'm happy to i just don't want to bog down people with no, I mean, no, at, at a basically. certain point, it became clear that it was not no longer a startup anymore. 
Um, right. That's what it was. Yeah. For all the the wide variety of hats that I was wearing, they found specialists for each one because uh, it wasn't a startup anymore. Right. They're well funded right. and successful launches every you know whatever. Um, but yeah, so it was at that point where it was like the timing w was right for me to, to uh, diverge um, mm -hmm. and kind of find my own find my own thing. It was perfect timing in that sense. That's great. So there was a little kismet there. You could have, I'm sure you had the opportunity to do something and stay within it and grow within it, but this just was the time to do something different. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I, I, uh, because this was kind of prior and like right close to the personal development, I don't think I gave myself the allowance to see the opportunity possibility that I could uh, make it a career, uh, right. if, that's, if that's the way to put it. Um, I know exactly what you mean, yeah. Yeah, it's good yeah the, uh, and, and th there's something here to say to the, I didn't, I didn't fully acknowledge in my own abilities that I was in someone else's dream job right out of high school and in side by I paralleled college with a job that people would consider a dream job after college. I was able to get before, like literally side by side with college, I didn't really acknowledge what the heck was going on with that, of what I was like, if I had my own voice, I probably wouldn't have gone to college if I didn't have to appease who I had to appease by just getting the degree. The degree mindset was how I was, that was, you know, it's probably not that much anymore, but like, I think you can relate how important that degree used to be. We're not dissimilar, you and I. Yeah. We're not dissimilar. I, I don't think I've needed, I, no one's ever, like, uh, um, I'm sorry, man. I, that's just like I said, I, cause I, uh, I can, I don't know if empathize is the right word, but I certainly understand it because I knew that college was a thing. My parents, like I said, you understand the struggle. I'm going to college. There's nothing around it. What I did was I chased a dream of aerospace that I thought was mine. Love flying, but before every flight, I wouldn't sleep. I'd be, I'd be anxious, nervous, sweating, like hoping. I live in Arizona where there's nary a drop of rain, and I would be praying that it would be canceled for, the flight would be canceled, you know what I mean? I can't, couldn't explain that in me. And yeah. what it was was like, I was just going through the motions and it turned out this was what I thought would be the most entertaining way to go through the motions of the college yeah. experience. Yeah. And the next thing, then it was this, and I never excelled at that. And I'm, the reason I'm asking you this is because it sounds like you push through things that I'm still trying to figure out 15 years down the road. Mm. And there's people in my position and there's people before you, they're trying to figure out what you seem to have figured out. So, and maybe you did and maybe I'm, I mean, I'm sure you have. You certainly figured it out for you because you're a pe you're able to express it and share it and and be at peace with it. But maybe there's that little bit, that one thing that you say that somebody's going to go, ah, boom, and yeah, you know, that's what we'll get. That's what I'm hoping we're going to get through in this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to. I definitely want to like dive into what you're what you're seeing there, uh, because the the reason I'm like kind of feeling the 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 generational thing here uh, is like you see nowadays people are making bank with just social media stuff uh, and and YouTubes and podcasts and the creativity of how people can make a living uh, sans career degree mindset is totally like I I was on the edge of this like cultural shift of society 
you know, I'm a hybrid in the sense that I grew up without tech and the emergence of the internet and tech. I have both uh, you as well. Like I had an Atari 2600, so I, right. I know. Yeah. And and at the tail end of the degree, just get the degree and find the job mindset. And but I was rebelling through the whole thing, but doing it to please. And, but I was rebelling the whole way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I, I'm. It's so mirrors exactly or parallels like, exactly my experience with it. The whole point that people go to college is to get a job at SpaceX, Tesla. You know, that's why you go to college. But I had that job without college. I didn't need to go to college, but I didn't actually acknowledge that uh, at the time because I was just in people pleaser, uh, just you know, doing what you sh should should do to be the good. <laughs> uh, yeah, graduate. the good boy, and and that's the thing. You go from literally from college, which is that step by step by step by step. It's very structured to a to an extent. You have to get these many credits to get this degree, and this degree has this many credits of this kind and whatever. And then you get to this job. Now the job, yeah, you get to be a jack of all trades, but it's still it's your next job, which is really your first job. You don't know it's SpaceX. SpaceX isn't SpaceX yet. I nope. mean, oh. let me ask, let me ask, how many years did you totally work? Uh, did you work in aggregate there? Would I you say? Six. Uh, how many rockets crashed? Did you make it to an ex to a successful rocket launch where he's like, this is the last one. If this doesn't go, we're done. Was that, I was, uh, I was there for two prior failures. And then I was actually, I, I had the responsibilities with the marketing team media coordinator uh to do the video production so i was okay so are any of your videos are any early spacex videos productions of yours that you yes. would want to promote okay feel free to promote them right now tell, tell us about just yeah. like where, where will we search, come up? Uh, on youtube uh falcon uh was it falcon one high roller flight three i think it was falcon one flight three high roller on youtube i edited that that was one I did. I worked with Elon on that video. It was the first successful launch and he wanted Very to make cool. a music video. That's awesome. And 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 I recall like some of those trials and tribulations. So you're working there. You're highly sensitive. You go. Let's go through the failures because you don't get to success without the failure. You don't yeah. win without struggling. Struggle is life. And that's probably what the youngest generations having a hard time understanding is it's not that much struggle like there was. Obviously, we've made it easier. It's great that we've made it easier, but there's a consequence to that, of course. So it's like one of these balance things that we play. Uh -huh, it's interesting. So you walk into the room. What are you feeling before the launch? <sighs> Just uh, as a highly sensitive person, what what like are your hairs standing up on your on the back of your head? Like, you're, what are you feeling? <sighs> well, there's two two sides here because one is you're hoping to god that the tech doesn't fail on the production side uh because it we didn't have a lot of budget and video streaming was in its infancy back then it uh it was it's not as easy it's it's crazy you didn't have an only fans account yet yeah it's yeah, so it's easy now only. it's so easy now to stream live but back then it was not easy at all especially if you didn't have a budget for you know professional grade equipment um and we were streaming video feeds from Kwajalein Island which is like further than Hawaii off the coast uh getting video streams sent to us from there until we did Florida um and then having you know to do production of hosts talking to scripts and what if this happens what if that happens so there's that side of the anxiety that's like I hope this video switcher doesn't shit the bed uh, right when the rocket goes up because okay. then uh, you, you know, everyone's going to be pissed. Um, but that's, that's let's be honest, that's a little internal, right? You're walking into the room. What What's coming at you as you're feeling that, right? What's from the crowd, right? Because you would have gathered for these launches, I would assume, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. They, they gathered and watched okay. um, in the floor. Uh, yeah. Electric, electric. I mean, it, um, especially the ones that didn't fail, like the successes where, you know, it's woo, woo, woo all through, like, and then 
you know, the one where the stage step didn't go correctly and there's like, oh, and then it's the failure, but then it does the success. <gasps> Holy shit, it did the stage step. <laughs> and then it keeps right. going at the entry burn. And um, you, you start to see these things for the first time um, and, and just the scale of difficulty uh, that, you know, this is not a government, you know, it, up until then it was governments and countries launching rockets. Right, right. People, I don't know if people really get that, that it was governments and countries were launching right. rockets. Yeah, this and they were generally extensions of the company. Let's not kid ourselves. Like the V, let's be honest, the Warner von Braun, the V2, it worked perfectly. It just landed on the wrong planet, right? I mean, it's it's not a joke here that, that how we use the tech, right? Yes. But yeah, an individual launched that. That's just unbelievable and i was in sixth grade when the challenger exploded. i remember watching us cart the tv into the room and i i didn't really know what was going on i was a kid man and it was yeah it was, but space was always it's just looking yeah. upward right up and out so yeah cool. and then you have like i think the best way to really express what the power of vision uh and mission from elon is just the simple thing of comparing you guys. The way rockets are up until now is you throw it away every single time. And you kind of get that because of how complex and it's rocket science. And you, it's like, oh my God, I don't know how, how this works. And then, but he's side by sides. He's like, do we throw away an airplane every time we fly it? And then it connects those two dots in you, and you're like, oh, yeah, it should be reusable. Why is it not reusable? And then all the little things of how you make that happen and all the failures to get to that point. But it's like that sort of vision thing that connects that dot of like, wait, why aren't we landing rockets back on? on it's hard, but like, why are we not? Um, and then going and solving those problems because you have the vision of, oh, yeah, we don't we don't throw away the uh, airplanes every single time. We fuel it up. We turn some things, and and it goes again, right? Uh, right. So it's that, interesting but, that yeah, the vision. And yeah. so it's fun. It's fun. It's funny you say that because I I watch those self writing and when they land, and the first thing that comes to mind is gimbal. Gimbal technology it has to be gimbals. And then I just think Segway. I'm like, it's got to be. Uh, this is where my brain goes. I go, was Elon thinking about the Segway? Because the Segway's got the gimbal self-writing. It's like, where? how does he connect? Because it is cultural. There's got to be a connect. But like, there's people who see those patterns in that visionary way that can see, well, we just made gimbals in our phones in this, you know, so we can do G, you know, G rating and whatnot. How do we incorporate that in some other? It's, I, to see that pattern recognition then connect them, it's just, I think it's called the uh, like first principles thinking too. What? Yeah, tell me about that first principles thinking. So I, it's something I've heard of it, but I I don't want to sound ignorant. So please yeah. explain it to me. And, <laughs> and I I definitely am not an, uh, a be an expert at uh, explaining this, but from my understanding, first principles thinking basically is uh, sort of approaching things from a blank sheet of paper. Uh, getting down to the, like the essence of what the problem is at the at the ground level and then working up from there getting to the the base level of how something works or the reinventing the wheel yeah and it then is the almost level. reinventing the wheel yeah, yeah. and it is, and that's the thing is i think you probably had that a lot growing up is reinventing the wheel you'd be like why dad isn't it like x or why why are we doing it this way and not that and you probably were one of those people i remember one of my early one of my early things was my dad always picked me up from work and i was you know i had to, one of those cards where i could work at 14 or whatever washing dishes or whatever you know and i would sit in the back seat and there was nobody in the front seat but i would he would always pick me up i'd sit in the back seat and then like one day i just went why am i sitting in the back seat and he's like uh, I don't know. And I'm like, well, I guess I'll sit in the front seat now. And then I sat in the front seat from then on. And, and it wasn't like, I look at someone like, all due respect to my brother. It's like, he probably rode the back seat until he probably drove himself. You know, it's like, that's just, 
it's just one of those things. It wasn't that I was combative. It was just, just I don't understand what this means. Why is it this way? Right. Yeah. So I find I think that's a beautiful way to deconstruct things and start is re almost reinventing the wheel. And it, it can become inefficient, but you don't get to innovation without without those inefficiencies, I would think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the two things that come up in response to that is because you you had asked me if I ever kind of brought that up. Uh, I don't think vocally, uh, you know, wasn't vocalized, but I definitely f saw a pattern kind of as a visionary, like of I would be a heat sinking missile to bugs or the wall, the limitation of something that I would using, you know, Final Cut uh, Pro back then, like version eight or whatever it was. And always finding the limitation or, man, this is slow as hell. I wish this was faster or I, a bug crash. Like always whatever I was doing, I could find the edge or the limitation of like, well, it would be much better if it was designed like how it is today. Right. Right. Um, right. So that was the, the visionary ales there is like always seeking the edge of whatever I was doing. And like, well, computers are very slow. And like always being faster than computer and like, you know, how can I break it? How can I break it? Yep, exactly. Um, I am very and, familiar. It's, I don't I don't. It's funny because people, you know, once again, I, I wonder if this I will ask you this. If I mean, oh, did you have a final point about that real quick or? Uh, no, it was kind of an aside of like going to, along the lines of the first principle saying, well, if it comes up again, we can. Oh, please. No, please. Yeah, oh, I, oh, I can. Uh, almost buy it. The one podcast I listened to. Uh, way, I think this was in college or something, taught me something. Uh, are you familiar with the trivium? This really blew my educational passion open. No, but as, is it? I've not heard of it, no. Yeah, it comes from the liberal arts education of, of like way, 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 way back. Um, in, uh, Greek or, or like, it goes way back. Um, I, I paint with broad brush strokes. Hopefully, no, no, it's we have to be conceptual here because yeah. I could probably keep up conceptual with almost anyone on this planet. I don't think I could get into the maths and the yeah. equations, but get me conceptually, and I, yeah, I'm about as open as one can, yeah, can grasp conceptually. So, like I've expressed up until this point, like I really hated school. Uh, it it was you know. Elementary school, I had that passion for learning because I wasn't in desk all day and I was free roaming. It was a Montessori school. And then it just got drained. I just hated hated education and, and that system so much. But when I learned about the trivium, it like reignited my love for learning, like curiosity and wonder and like pure learning. And it, what it is in terms of like first principles is – it's split into three different things, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And I was going to say, is it some kind of, is it some kind of check and balance on itself where you create the three concepts and as long as the three don't contradict each other, now you have a complete idea or something, I would mm -hmm. think. It's something, is so, so, uh, sort of, yeah. It's like, first you need to be on terms. The, like, understand the terms that you're using when you're speaking with someone. Like, let's use... You know what? That's perfect. Let's use that in today's world. Let, I don't want to get in the weeds, but gender ideology. Oh, okay. Let's, okay. let's go, okay. right? Let's start with that. If we're, What <sighs> is the definition that we have? If we don't have the starting definition, how can we possibly understand? I'll leave it at that, right? I don't want to, I don't want to get too deep, but that's a very simple one where it's, if I don't even understand the definition that you are trying to provide me, if it doesn't have a lucid thought to it, I'm, I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I'm not arguing that. I'm yeah. saying for people who don't understand it, if it isn't, then that we have a already a logical error right there. Okay, yeah. so that would be an example of that. Would would you say is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So getting... what would be that other branch then that, of the three? The... So grammar and then grammar, okay. logic, like you're saying, under like so. connecting the the words together with logic, and then rhetoric is the ability to sh share the wisdom. You can only okay. share the wisdom if you have the grammar and the logic. Right. And so 
I when I listened to this podcast, which like really exploded all the the details of this and the the liberal arts education uh, that that this was supplied for, um, it just it gave me so much ability to find that love for learning again because it was like the way that language worked, understanding the mechanics of language and meaning and wisdom and then you start to connect the dots more and it, yeah yeah that's great let so let's try i'm trying to think of a different example for like the logic thing where you, you see like a dissonance of logic yes let's use let's use covid because we got we can use one for each right where's a where was the logic like you have the guy saying no masks and then saying masks and then the data is no masks and the this, that, and the other data coming out, once again, we're having a, a logic break. We're having a logic error and creating crazy fractures in our society. So yeah. there's a logic error. And then the wisdom error is, how? What? where is the bottleneck? Would you say that's tech sharing it and the suppression of something, some information over others? Or the an, a global view of the WHO, for example, or the WEF or something? That really opens up the talk about rabbit holes of let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. I, I, I appreciate. I told that. you, man. I told like, you. <laughs> please, please, yeah. Like, let, let's do this because I, I'm always looking for heated things like well, this. It's not heat. This isn't even heated. This is exciting. What are we talking about? Heated. I'm excited. Oh, I, is that the pro wrestling? That's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get you. I get you. Because uh, you're obviously seeing where I'm coming from, and you obviously have an idea of things. I am this. I came from beliefs. I came up from a very extremely conservative, work hard, sweat equity. That's what it was. My, Like I said, my background wouldn't allow for anything other than that yeah. philosophy to be spread in our in our household. That's just what I grew up with. That's neither good nor bad nor indifferent. It just is. That's what I had to deal with. Everyone deals with their own. I have. Let I'll go quickly. I was pro death penalty, very pro war. I was bought into Iraq. I had T-shirts that said, "Hey Saddam, this scuds for you." I was in the Eagle Scouts. Like, I was so sold and manipulated and pulled into things in our 80s and the 80s were just it was what we're doing now just not exposed because we didn't have social media i mean let's it's just not exposed yet so we got told these narratives from very small groups of people telling us how it is and now we're finding this beautiful expansion of that but with that comes huge responsibilities too but I'd rather have the responsibility of a, of something being mistold versus being suppressed something that shouldn't have been, right? Yeah. That's just my ideology. That's where I come from. Now, that said, I have softened on my hard rightness. I'm not like, I'm not combative. I'm really anti-war. And I really try to think we have other solutions. We, we should have resources now. We should be pretty good. That said, I understand conflict happens. We have different actors and evil actors out there in the world. So with all that said, that's where I'm coming from. But I would assume you already just picked up on that from my ridiculous rant. So what are your thoughts on how the wisdom aspects not being, you know, shared properly, I guess? If we're kind of creating a, a starting point in more of the conspiracy level things uh, where we're looking at government as a controlling mechanism of, of civilization and society. Like I, that, that would be my first question, like to, as a, right finding terms with you is absolutely so yeah let's do that let's start here i'm, yeah. I'm going to be really simple with you because i don't i'm a, you can understand i'm a pretty lucid individual yeah this is my i'm you talked about trivium did aristotle have anything to do with trivium or was that not Might part be. of his okay it, if he did this is perfect then because yeah. this is my philosophy 
It is the mark of a curious mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. Sure. How about that? So once again, we are seeing some exposures of things. I don't want to get into specific conspiracies. You notice I haven't been like I speak COVID only because it was just on it's on the front news. We obviously have confusion among other people about other things out there. I want to try to be broad because I don't think it's worth getting into the weeds because you and I probably aren't very like I I listen to political stuff, but I'm biased too because what's the information I get? Yeah, I'm going to come up with my information from my side. I'm curious, maybe on a broader sense, is let's talk visionary wise. How would you share the wisdom? Let's do it that way. I don't I don't want to make it bogged down into like you know yeah. tech control bad government. You know, let's not do that because this is not what this conversation is about anyway. Yeah, you know, it's it's about it's about you and 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 understanding how you view it. Yeah, on that level, then I I would probably communicate it more as a as a massive shift in consciousness. Um, the way I see how it all played out is this shift in consciousness. On a on a global like humanity level species level, uh, is is not going to be without its challenges, and it's going to really direct us to what I would consider as like the big picture universal narrative in every in every human mind. And that is fear versus love. That is the rivalry of the universe uh, from a human species duality uh, perspective. And what I perceived during COVID and the way that all played out is it really had the the stench of a last gasp heave, Hail Mary of controlling people to to uh, to be subservient to the fear of whatever that control is trying to keep you in. Now for a lot of other people that were kind of more conscious uh, of that choice, it seemed like it was really putting that fear, love, fear, passion, fear, power dynamic, fear, freedom dynamic, kind of as close to our faces as possible. Because when I really sat with the weight, no, I kind of am getting a no from my body uh, about about getting um, the vaccine. Uh, That's what I got too. And I spent. Oh, I'll let you finish. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, please share. Like it, I didn't rush to say no, but I was dragging my feet put, put on the fence right that's what you're because i was saying. feeling i was really conscious of feeling the dynamics and and that the planet is undergoing the most massive shift in consciousness that's ever happened on this planet and this is like a massive test of you're either choosing enslavement or you're choosing freedom in every single moment but this really brought it to the forefront of which one are you going to choose? Because I remember feeling the, the freedom to say, no, 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 nah, I'm going to drag my feet and see how this plays out. Cause I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to listen to the fear because I was already kind of elevated on my conscious evolution to know the difference, to be sensitive to fear driven, passion driven or love driven. Right. And the more that I did not necessarily fight, uh, I just, I didn't voice, I didn't, I didn't get in the way. I didn't, you know, I just, I watch, I, I like observing. Um, and, Sigma. and 
Is that what it is? You're a sigma, right? Is that what it is? <laughs> what is that? Not, uh, versus an alpha? It's tight. It's, oh, uh, yeah. we'll talk. We'll talk about that. I'm not sure. It's it's a positive thing. It's yeah. a good thing. Anyway, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just um, everything you're saying just brings so many thoughts over this this last couple of years, uh, last few years for sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the the more I really so you, you did not, but just didn't mention it. Basically, yeah. is what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I could feel the the guilt and the shame, and but I was very conscious of. I, I don't think I need it. And you would have uh, did yeah. so. You did not, correct? I did not. I, I'm just telling you right now. You would not have had a good outcome. Just telling you right now. I absolutely 100. percent There's no doubt. Yeah. I, so I mean, trust, trust, trust that in me. Whatever. It's trust me on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Highly sensitive and understanding. You knew no, and I I did the same thing. And to your point, highly sensitive. I walked in every situation telling me I'm going to kill my grandmother or kill somebody if I don't do this. And I, uh, I'm, I was, well, I am diabetic, but I'm now pre-diabetic numbers, but I was, I had some comorbidities and I said, well, let me see, what should I do? Should I work on me and get better or should I let an external force control what I can do for myself? So I just took vitamin D. I got, I lost some weight. I got my diabetes under control. I got it twice. I'm, I hate to say, but I breezed through it. I'm lucky. I probably got, I think I got Delta and Omicron, but I breezed through it. Never stopped my lifestyle. Lived in Arizona, was outside. I masked everywhere because that's just what you do. I'm sure you probably did the same out of courtesy. Like we're probably in that thing is courtesy is kind of a layer that we probably start at is let's just be courteous to each other. I, you're not going to get my respect yet, but let's start with courtesy because I, and and one of the things that where I'm getting with is like we conflate courtesy and respect. So like I don't respect you, therefore I don't need to be courteous to you anymore. It's like, well, no, you should be courteous specifically because you disrespect me. And that is how we can live next to each other and really not like each other and move to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, so so it was one of those things. So for me, it was always I question myself, the guilt, the shame I put myself through. And now in hindsight, I am looking at real data that tells a different story than the story we were told. That's all. It's it's my Iraq war. It was, I'm glad I didn't get bamboozled this time. And I, I hate to say it, but those narratives tend to be, they rhyme, they tend to be parallel or they tend to repeat, right? History doesn't repeat itself, humans do. It certainly rhymes. And we've seen this now. I'm one of those people, two paces out of the tube, it's really hard to get that back in, that trust, right? So. I'm happy to share where my quote unquote biases would be because they are biases, but they're not biases in belief. They're biases in ideas because I think beliefs are become concrete. And if I have a belief, if you attack the belief, you're attacking me. Why would I, I, I now take it personally. Now I have to defend, like I mentioned the nepotism thing, right? It's like, no, that's, that was, it, it had a little nepotistic flair to it, but it wasn't nepotism to your extent. It's nuanced, right? So we can speak it once we know what it is. It's kind of like that. That's how I see the world. Mm. So mm. interesting. Did you didn't mention it? Did anyone find out? Did you have any repercussions or any social? How did you feel? Because you're highly sensitive. How would you have felt in a lot? I would think in a lot of social situations in California, being in tech, being in you know, highly educated mindset with a lot of people with degrees and. Mm -hmm. You know, I I am very uh, crafty of staying away from uh, those things, right? In in the same sense, yeah, your thing. whole life. Uh, um, and and really, because I'm I'm more uh, you know intro. I mean, I'm definitely in the middle, but like more introverted yeah. leaning. The lockdown wasn't that bad for me either because right. it was closer to my lifestyle of like, I, I like quiet and I, I like, you know, um, I got to start working from home. I'm not going to lie. I've been, I've been very lucky to do that because yeah. to your point though, it's funny because you do mention introvert, but the, you, you mold with people. You obviously have the social skills. I'm sure you worked on a little bit, but I'm, you probably had them. Um, where I find, I, I, I don't know if we are similar in that way, but it's like, I prefer to be alone. Mm -hmm. Give me solitude. Let me have the 42 conversations in my head with the 36 other people that are in there and let them work it out. And I'm good. I, I 
found myself to really enjoy that more and more to my detriment because I was very much more social growing up. Like I was in a cover band for for four or five years. So like you had to be social, you know, you had to get out there and, and yeah. really put yourself out there. But how how do you handle that for yourself? Like how how would you say, is that what you prefer? More solitude versus Yeah. Oh, 100%. Okay. Yeah. And then obviously smaller groups versus larger. And... Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's really strange too, but like, I don't really ha uh, have an urge to travel personally. Uh, it, it's not, I don't, I don't really look forward. It makes to, me think of remote like, viewing all of a sudden. But <laughs> just for business. <laughs> For like, if I have a business reason to travel, I'm all over. Like that, that gives right. me the juice, uh, right? To be excited. It gives you a purpose, right? It's like yeah. a purpose for mission, it, but yeah. not for yourself. It's not your per. It's not your self purpose to work. Yeah, but otherwise, I have no reason to travel. Like, I, no reason to to leave. Like, <laughs> that's that's just a little quirk about me. But um, yeah, yeah that's cool. I totally yeah. get that, and I, it actually makes me ask a question about your the future of this, and I'll have to remind remember that. So. Let me put a pin in that. So. Yeah. But um, yeah, so traveling, it's interesting because like for me, I work hard. You put me on a clock for an employer. You're going to get everything and you're not going to you're going to get even ideas that I'm not I don't need to make. You're getting my ideas. You're getting feedback. You're getting whatever. How can I make your business better? Because I signed up a contract to work for you. That's how yeah. I did it. So I, I'm one of these sweat equity people. You get me off the clock and my, pa not even passion, it's my momentum just completely fades. I want, I have the interest to do this, for example, like podcasting has been something I, I really enjoy is understanding. And I mean, sharing for sure, but I'd love to get a different viewer, how people think. I wanna know how you think because it's way more important than what you think. Because mm -hmm. if you get to how you think, we could probably get to some compromise because we could probably find a way to work out a difference to a general agreement. But how do I get motivated myself? It's it's the craziest thing. I will kill myself for an employer. It's just kind of my German upbringing. It's just how we, you know, it's just the duty and the loyalty. And I've never broken that. I just am stuck, for example, in once duty ends, shutdown mode for me not self duty like i could totally i if i put half the work ethic in that job right that i'm doing versus my own for example but we know what we know what successes would come right obviously you're you're uh proof of that I, I in a way right so how how do you keep from shutting down shutting down in what what, what capacity so just in the motivation sense, it's like, I just worked eight hours or 10 hours, whatever, crushed it. I did what I needed to do. This other thing I like to do, I know there are steps that need to happen for that mm -hmm. to be. Why am I not motivated, for example, to making those steps for myself mm -hmm. when I'm more than happy? Not, and I have to say more than happy only because I'm not doing it differently. I'm more than happy to, to give to another in that way. It's we jumped a couple sharks, by the way. I I know we jumped a couple, couple concepts, but we'll get back to that. All good, all good. I I love the dance. Um. So it's definitely something because you know I've dealt with procrastination, perfectionism, all things that kind of make you avoid shit. Um, I resemble all those remarks. Yeah. Yeah. But the more I really apply the that wisdom and that transformation of the transformation from being fear driven to passion driven and valuing freedom over survival. It has really played itself out so beautifully and in a lot of learning, of course, too. Because the, the metaphor that I love to use is, is fuel, passion as a fuel, as a, as a battery and a fuel. Because 
when that self-discovery or or conscious evolution transformation that you're you're doing with yourself or the self-help or what personal development self-improvement from that big picture lens it's it's really about looking at the purity of this fuel or impurity of this fuel and cleaning out the particulates of fear that are dragging its performance and and the more that you're actually focused on that rather than the external getting something done or getting to a finish line destination bound but you're more inner game, inner world cleaning, it takes care of itself. And motivation isn't that much of an issue. It's it's It becomes more about structure and or lack thereof and finding the help or, or AI assistance that you need to, okay, it, it's if, if I put 30 minutes on the calendar for this, then I'll look at it differently because, oh, it's a structure, something to sink into for a set amount of time. I've got my bounds and I can immerse, right? It's, it's, you're, you're more understanding how you work rather than trying to find motivation all the time. The passion takes care of itself. It's more about how you want to play with the flow and, and, putting rocks in the river so that it flows in the particular way that you want to, to, to go with it and you're c- creating much less resistance that way uh, against yourself. That's a beautiful way to say it in that way because it kind of clicked just the way you were talking about because you're talking about I'm going through my life. I, not to personalize it, but one's going through their life through the same motions that got through college. that got you through, you know, got you to the next thing. To your point, you've now usurped that next step by step weird way you just made it a structure but with the passion yes so let's get let's get the passion but let's step let's step out of spacex you you're working on some therapy things i'd love for you to share some epiphanies you realized in some therapy things if you can if you're happy to share uh that you think a couple words of wisdom to people would go oh that that's like a nice little you know i'm a big picture big picture thinker so my my, to come with that brush um no i love it it's and this is the point is watching this i'm feeling it all kind of unfold as you're doing it so it's an interesting process yeah The best like s- synthesis or, or synopsis, I don't know what the difference is, that I can communicate is the things that you think are negative are not hard-coded that way. You have the power of perception at your wielding where you can flip a polarity just by seeing a different meaning on something. And when I learned that, uh, that anything can flip uh, just by understanding the mechanics of perception and meaning and opening your mind to other possibilities, the things that you're confined by or weighed down by, depressed by, can be flipped into gifts, into opportunities. Uh, that really set me on a path to f- reframe uh, a lot of the preconceptions and, and confinements of, of, of limited uh, beliefs, as you said. Like the things that felt so concrete can be lifted and tr- uh, spiraled in a different way. What very well, very well said. That makes that's a perfect piece um, perspective, basically. Yeah, yeah, viewpoint. Like how how else can I use a hammer? It it doesn't always have to hit a nail. Exactly. Right? I mean that's really what. Or what can we make out of this hammer that would not need to be hitting a nail all the time? You know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. So, 
perspective that's that's beautiful so you you gain some perspective you step away from spacex and did you go right into your own or did you have a couple other things in between that and, I, and the next thing is passion company or what's the next oh and no oh, the, no the, that's imagine yeah you, you're gonna have to give me through because i know you had a number of them on the way so right walk me through them yeah the next so i was you know because i wasn't full on the accelerator like i used to be I actually took the time to be like, oh, I have a opportunity here to like not uh, go straight to the next thing. Um, and I gave myself that space, uh, which was very special and and uh, uh, fun um, in that sense of really taking that time and space to really follow my own excitement and not just do something because I should do it because it's the right thing because you you need to have a job but if you don't have a job you're a failure you know whatever the those voices were saying of the fear if you don't do this if you don't I was disregarding that and being like no I can stay here and not do anything for a little bit and I started to get into my own writing uh, and, and journaling and stream of consciousness and really putting pen to mind to paper and just uh, pouring it out. Um, and with this same message of, of perspective really came the, the first vision of, of a concept uh, to share uh, through art uh, and entertainment. Um, But at the time, I didn't, I didn't consider myself a creative art, art artist uh, at the time. There was still some self worth issues on the ability to acknowledge that that I was a, a imaginative and a creative individual. Uh, but you know, compared you to will my, never shake the imposter syndrome. I can promise you that. I'm yeah, just, exactly. Yeah. Uh, especially I have it in droves, like every single one of my personalities has it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, especially when you're like comparing yourself to an actual artist that can draw amazing things yeah. uh, out of nowhere. You're like, oh, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> I just love when I'm when I understand every concept and I feel personally like I can't do any of them. You know, it's the same type of thing. It's like, how did that person get to where they got? It's really yeah. it's not out of envy by any means. It's like how what? how what you know so it's yeah. one of those things yeah so, right, so you started carving this piece um of how to make it yeah. how to start some kind of entertainment art based there was a calling of wow if i could flip this thing that i thought was so negative about myself to something that was actually a power dare i say a superpower well, that's a message that some people, like a lot of people, need to hear, uh, but not just to teach them. It should be through something that is conveying it in a in a cool way, uh, Kubrick way. Um, <laughs> and so, but it was just a concept at that point. But I didn't know how to do anything with it. Uh, and then with the acting that I was doing at that time, you were you had asked me about that before. I was doing a college student film shoot uh, where I was uh, I was playing some sort of role and I met a writer Leon Conliff uh, on set he was he was doing some uh, uh, back stage stuff or I mean behind the camera um, and he his gift was like world building uh, and he's a DND &D, uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, master right so <laughs> I played it growing up, man. I've got the hard books and everything still in my closet. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Choose your own adventure books. I've got them all. Were you a game back. master? Uh, I guess loosely. I, I I played it with my friends. We probably made we made yeah. our own rules. Come on, like oh, like yeah. I could follow like rules. Yeah. I could never read an instruction manual. Are you kidding? I had to play in my head. I couldn't play on a 
I yeah. couldn't play in the. Yeah, well, I couldn't he play got in. he was deep on it. You know, coming up with his own story. Yeah. Oh yeah, I drew I drew mazes on graph paper. I had you know legible graph paper all the time. I carried that with me more than I carried a college rule notebook with. Yeah, me. it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's totally. Yeah. But uh, so, but I started to share my concept with him to which it you know explodes into a world in his brain of like we got a story here we got characters we got this really cool thing and started driving on that chemistry then we found a, a illustrator and then my best friend came on and uh we started a little comic book company where it was the first thing that i invested uh, my own money into as a coming from being indecisive and overthinking and never feeling confident to pull the trigger or take the leap on on one of my ideas i had many ideas but not i i couldn't focus i couldn't adh like all the stuff that is just scattering all yeah, the things yeah. like both of our current mindsets at this yeah. moment yes this exactly. this actually this was know, manic correct i looked it up is that, uh, is that what it was called mania i'm gonna yeah. call it mania correct yeah. okay yeah to 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 quote uh I, I want to give you the credit. You didn't mention it, so let's mention it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you yeah. wrote a comic book. You started, it, like, a, you started kind of a dark horse comics, or just kind of its own little comic book brand. Exactly. With one one central book, or did you have two or three? Like, did you have one piece? You started with one, and then just broke off of that, or branched off of that, or? Yeah, it was weird because we did the universe building, uh, all everything, but. but uh, behind it um we had plans to do the first six as our first volume but we only got to three uh okay. and we that, which shall well, this is your this is your first venture outside of this is that correct is this your first solo venture yep and you made three you made three pieces of content for humans to touch put their hands on look through yep. experience okay yep. that's content i, I, I don't content. know another way to say it right you can yeah. let's you know people don't make some people make nothing so like that's an that's an amazing feat. Yeah. Did that discourage you because you set it on six, or that encourage you that you could step forward and do something? I'm sure you felt a little of both. So let's go through the proportionality of it and and see yeah. how that you use that to drive you to your next thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, because I'm so uh, open minded, I can see all the all the different versions of the perception on that, like. One end, you see the fail, entrepreneurial. Fail. Well, in the moment, I'm thinking, I guess, when at coming out of it is what I'm thinking more immediacy because that then, that mindset would then kind of encourage your next move or your next thought, right? Not how you're reflecting on it, but like more how you felt in the moment at the time. I think it, it was more, it felt like a, if I didn't allow the negativity to get in, it, it felt more like a bookmark. It felt more like, okay, we're going to put it on the shelf for a bit and we're going to revisit it at another time because of, of how much love we put into the foundation of it. So um, you saw it as more of a, hey, we're going to table this project. We're going to pursue another one and we're going to revisit this project. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. How long ago was that? This you know, was 13, 14, 15 uh years there uh 2013 I, 14 15 I, 16 yeah has it come up to revisit at all with your friends or anyone uh not yet not yet but the uh, smile tells me there's something on the something in your brain so about much, it something there's so much there and I'm, I'm so passionate about the concept i can tell you just light up just mention. yeah because well one thing it was ugh, talk talk about visionary ales <laughs> two things one is this was prior to marvel explosion uh mc yes. and D dc yeah if you, this is prior to spawn this would be spawn era i would guess right so yeah. uh, the, mcfarland's just coming out i mean i could get into comics because comics was also another stupid yeah. geeky thing of mine but yeah. not stupid that wasn't stupid that was awesome as a kid but um yeah, I was into all that stuff. Like, I have the first, you know, first of Wolverine from, you know, the 80s, not the original original, but, you know, from the first in the, I think, 87 when they re-released it, re-released it before. 
So I'm once again, I'm lucky. I come really born 74. So Star Wars would have been really my Mm -hmm. really child. I mean, Empire would have been at seven probably. So I would have been really into it right then. And then just took off in space and comics and all that. You get me anything that's not physically here or gets me with something that's away from me for some reason. And I'm I'm all in because it's outside of me. I because that's what I strive to understand is what I what I'm not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so, so the, I mean, just watching you light up, just mentioning it, just tells me everything you need to know about it. Yeah. Have you, you've made some, have you ever flipped through them again, just in nostalgia, for nostalgia's sake, like pulled it out of a box and. Not, uh, not very recently, uh, but uh, yeah, I, the, it's in the closet. <laughs> it's definitely in the closet. You'll have to take a look at Something's telling me you should take a look at it. I'll again. send you some. I'll yeah, you. I'd love to see it. Yeah, I'd love to see it. I'd, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. I, I well, there, absolutely there's would love definitely, that. I think once I have the marketing bandwidth and, and some bandwidth open, there's definitely a revival that needs to take place because the the other, like, ahead of our to- ahead of my time sort of vibe here is that... We're very close, but it is weird because of the technology, it kind of halved all the generations, in my opinion. It's almost like every five years versus 10 or 20 is now a generational shift. I mean, it's yeah. pretty crazy. So it's, it's, it's speeding up. It's speeding up right. like crazy. Yeah. Uh, it was that back then, because there's a huge mission behind this comic uh, of mental health empowerment that I needed to uh, kind of be really all in on it. Um, and that not just to be entertainment, to be, but to have something, uh, you know, mindful behind it. I saw that and it, it made me, it piqued my interest because it approaches it from a chasing Amy serious point of view versus the generic, like, hi, I'm a superpower. I feel different, but how do I, oh, I'm still a superpower, you know, superhero or whatever. So I, I'm curious about that, the way the name mania and, and the mental health aspect. Do you care to delve in how you came up with that concept of the name and the? Yeah, it it came off from the uh, what I was mentioning with your question about the therapy takeaway was the the whole psychological mechanic underlying our universe and and, and the the all the attention to detail that we put into not going magic or fantasy with it uh but logic uh logic and emotion coming together uh came about with the attention that we put into the the psychological reasons in which these superpowers arise in our universe and with that if you kind of look at the layers and you know the stanley kubrick kind of mentality of of the cinema is there's a lot that can be transmitted to people in terms of mental health empowerment uh, that we got some really cool feedback on. But um, if you look at back then, it wasn't a conversation. It, it was not the conversation that it is today, but it like that's what we felt it needed to happen because we saw where it needed to go, of course, right? Um, right. But it... it that really was a, a trailblazing thing uh, in terms of... And that, that's the thing. It, it sounds... Absolutely does because of the, what the content matter and everything. So I'm very looking forward to that. So thank you. That That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So you table this. Yes. You still release three three of the six. That's pretty impressive. How many prints yeah. of each? 100? 200? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how it works with... Prints. Uh, yeah, there's a, a few... 200? Yeah, we've got a box of each. Yeah, something like that. Awesome. Yeah, and like I said, got to speak at Comic Con too. That was pretty epic. <laughs> Which the San Diego one or? Yep. Oh, okay. That would that would have sealed it. What year was? Wait, what year was that? Twelve. Oh, okay. I yeah. don't recall that off the top of my. It's probably the same sixteen or something. Oh, okay. So it was a little later. Okay. Yeah, yeah I was at. Uh, I was in San Diego during the Big Bay bust. I uh, the the fireworks on July Fourth where they all went off at the same time by accident. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I. I well, recent, I, right? Uh, yeah, it was 2012. Okay, it was actually the 10 year anniversary last year. Yeah, so I went down there with my girlfriend, and it was like early open table days. People had not known what this thing was. I'm like, I heard of this thing. Let me check it. We end up getting front row seats at like Sally's on the waterfront, which is right by this pier, and right off is one of the barges parked there. 
And my girlfriend's like, oh, I've never seen fireworks like this set up before. And they had these four barges choreographed to music and they were all going to go. All of a sudden, five minutes before, everything goes off. Oops. And I just put my hand in my hand. She's like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I'm like, no, 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 no. It, it all, it's all, that's just all of it. Something happened. And you could, and then they had just, all these people spent just exorbitant amounts of money just going to this episode thing. And it just turned out to be a little bit of a blunder. But I remember walking down the street seeing Comic-Con, what, it's about usually two weeks after that, mid-July, right. something like that. Yeah. July. So that's what, that's what triggers, that's how I think. I trigger with memories and yeah, things like that, so. Tell me about Comic Con because now that I heard this, I did not know this. And once again, every answer you have is just fifteen more questions, Jeremy. So, so how you okay? How did you get asked? How was that experience? And then tell me about it, kind of at the if you can, if you can recall these things because this yeah. is fun stuff. No, it was uh, one of the the people. Uh, he was sort of like an advisor for us, you know. Um, he had a contact in the San Diego Comic Con. Um, forgot what her job title was. I was. It was something with the panels, I think. And he was able to facilitate that they were doing or wanted to do a, a panel about mental health and comics, um, and then kind of pitched me. As as a as a good panelist uh, for that, and yeah, it was awesome. It was it was fun. It, the I definitely was feeling more confident by then, um, and it was really cool to to kind of be in that in that spotlight. Um, with with that kind of you know a panel uh, in front of a, a, a pretty big audience right certainly helps the ego and it's certainly something you have to conquer crowds are super intimidating and if you don't if you weren't really a speaker prior to that getting thrust into that position yeah can be pretty daunting do you recall anyone you might have been on the panel with that that are currently in any mental health or anything else anyone else like that uh, I do not recall. Uh, one of them, Dave Elliott, he he's a he's a seasoned veteran of of comics. Very cool, very yeah. cool. So okay, so you got to do Comic Con and you table this, and now your next project. What what pings in your mind to start your next project? What is that, and how does that come about? Yeah, so there was. A few kind of dabblings in like uh, life coaching, transformational coaching, kind of wanting to work with other people in that vein of like support. And uh, I couldn't, uh, it was a lot of experimenting uh, with like what to call it, what, what am I do, like, what do I do? How do I explain it? Like there was a lot of experimental kind of grounds there. Uh, and uh, doing some courses, having course groups, group coaching, really just trying a bunch of things and seeing what fit, what d didn't fit during that time. But all through when I started the journaling and, and writing, there was something forming that was bigger than me for sure bigger than me, but also bigger than I could fathom uh, or comp uh, comprehend. But it was all starting to form on the paper in what I would consider like a soul's work is the, the best way that I can kind of capture the scale and scope of, of its connection to me. Uh, it is my soul's work. I don't I couldn't explain it like that back then, but it, you know, not up to me it is, is kind of the, you know, it, it not up to me. <laughs> I, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, I've had a couple not up to me moments. I'll share, I'll share, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's funny because it's just yeah magnetized so that start that you know we're talking since 2012 this stuff has been laying laying in in day books i call them pages upon pages just because i would love going to a coffee shop and just writing having having a coffee and just letting it go like daydreaming and then pouring it on the page and this stuff started to flow in and and soul's work and this is this is what i'm calling um, imagination technology now because it's it's definitely evolved with me uh in understanding and communication the best way that i can really i guess spark someone's excitement on this is to actually go back to where we started which was being aware that i share a birthday with Albert Einstein. Ever since elementary school, I knew that when I picked somehow, somehow, talk about synchronicity, so, right? Picked just, right. to do a biography on. Right. Somehow, right? Yeah. And, and it's just really quickly to jump in really quickly is is the funny part is we talk about, I, I thought about that for you and my equate is the uh, James Dean died on my oh. birthday. Oh, he crashed. He crashed the Porsche on my birthday. So it's like it's funny how yours is the birth of Albert effing Einstein, and my perception is the death of a rebel. It's like once again, it's not mine. Isn't equated to a birth, right? And we'll get to perception because once again, this is old school generation thrust into a world that was churning over the last four or five gener uh, decades, right? But please tell me. You so kismet. Here's your kismet. You're told to do it. You're told to do a book report. Tell me about this biography. And you know, you go to that school library where you know it's all on the shelf, and you you're say go go pick one. Right? They send you off into it. And for some calling kismet reason, there was the Albert Einstein biography, and then you dive in and you're doing your homework and. Oh, he was born on March 14th. That's my birthday too. And ever since then, I think there's like a, a soul connection because he took his work uh, to the edges of science and mathematics and quantum mechanics, right? We can talk quantum too. Yeah. Please. Yeah. I'm look I'm looking. We're not done yet, man. We're not done. Oh. So. Yeah. The uh and and revolutionized all all those fields and and changed the paradigm on how humans see time and space together over train schedules right the the train speed of light light beam working as a patent clerk right yeah. all these yeah. things yeah. yep and so we are like i think any any great artist will say standing on the shoulders of giants or scientists right like science artists whatever so that's that's how i look at it is i'm standing on his shoulders and taking the imagination to the next uh evolution and and taking his work and going a little bit further not necessarily in the bounds of not in this not in the field not in, in the, the field. concept yeah i get it yeah, but in the in the it's in hard the to quantify that, though. That's the problem. And and it's not not disrespect. It's hard to quantify when it's not in a field. Yeah. When it's conceptual. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's really hard to quantify that because what happens is how do you measure? How do you measure progress? I mean, you, it's much more challenging than on a piece of paper right, where you can actually write it down and, and have Don't an matter. outcome. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. So just to 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 share that I had I did a. Uh, Stephen Hawking's brief history of time for my ninth grade uh, book report. So, yeah. my head almost exploded right at, at that moment. So, but uh, okay. So you, so Einstein's the inspiration. You've always been inspired by Einstein, obviously. But what was the inspiration that got you out of the click track? You know, the train tracks, the set path 
of college, job, blah, 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 to how did you apply the passion of Einstein to the video biography or to your current machinations of your journaling? What, what what pages on the journal kept popping out? Like those types of questions are, are the things I'd love to ask you. The best way to probably explain it is mechanics. I really am curious about understanding the mechanics of things. And so the direction of this writing would be towards inner world concepts, tools, thoughts, to understanding the mechanics of, of the things that we don't take the time to actually ask questions about. You know, I, I, I shouldn't say never. It, it's more like we were taught, like the uh, the the rock bottom uh, thing that you're talking right. about. It's like yeah. sometimes we need that near death experience to finally ask the question, "What is the purpose of life?" Right? For sure. Yeah. I didn't want to wait that long. I, I I was asking these big questions of like, well. People have all these deathbed realizations on on the deathbed, but what happens if I have them earlier? Like, shouldn't that be the goal? Is to have all the all the important realizations what ifs, right? er earlier, so that you're not having to realize it when it's the deathbed. Right. So there there was that kind of you know. And, and and let's be honest, we're in the United States in the 2000 aughts or the aughts, right? Like yeah. we have opportunity to try it and maybe not make it and still get on with our life if we don't. Not everybody globally has that beautiful opportunity at times, right? And, and this is not, it's not about spreading wealth or anything. It's just, this is the reality of the world, right? Is that some people are limited genetically. I, you know, IQ is a thing. I, it's not the thing, but it is a clear marker of the capacity to understand concepts or to, and it's not, that is not critical of people who ha, whose number is lower because I guarantee that person has a quality or a skill that I, that other people with a higher number in that department don't possess, right? So it's, it is finding that, but sometimes with limited genetics, it does make it challenging to find the limitless potential. Yep. And if you can't even conceptualize that as a thing, right, how can you possibly get to that? And I, I probably jumped a couple steps there, but it just popped in my head in that way. And this isn't, once again, this isn't to criticize. This is how things are. So how does one, you and I probably had a little more means than others. I, I would like to think we probably did. This is how it was. I know what my mom went through to get me here. So thank goodness that I'm here. Now all we can do is hopefully do what we can to help someone else or contribute yeah. back, right? So how does one who's possibly limited to understand get to follow that or is that maybe a luxury of not like this is how i've always seen it i've always seen very let's use iq as a number let's just use iq it's just stupid it's the dumbest straight up marker but someone with a very high iq and someone with a very very low iq is either super happy or super angry there's really they either got it figured out on the on the top end or like me, don't have it figured out and don't understand why, right? Or whatever the sticking point is. Or you've got people who are happy because they don't know any better or are angry because they think they know everything and really don't know anything, right? Like these are the these are the extremes in which we live. How do we navigate? Obviously, the, the top end is the easy part, therapy. That's easy. <laughs> the bottom end, the, on, on the bottom, sorry, the other end of the spectrum, that is not a bottom end because... I think that people, I know very creative people who can't spell a word. Mm -hmm. The, 
okay, that's okay, because I've seen what they've done on a, on a canvas. I've seen how they touch a heart. You know what I mean? Like, we can we can go through the the joy in certain people's faces that you would think should be suffering and the and you're like why am i how do i feel this they don't it's not even experienced as a suffering you know what i mean so so how how do we navigate those pieces on the on the the end where it's more struggling to grasp your concept to improve or to find the passion i it's probably asking it wrong but i'm I'm trying to get there. I, I'd like to think our, let's use a Maslow's hierarchy. We, you and I, we got our house, we've got our clothes, we've got our food, got a, some healthy relationships, probably grew up pretty okay, not hurting. No one's good, but not hurting, or nothing's perfect, but no, not hurting, right? It does afford us a little more luxury to expand our ideas to reach for something that is outside of reach when someone whose reach outside their reach is something we already have. Yeah. For example, not for granted, but something that happened right for us that yeah. we didn't have that extra stepping stone. I'm asking only because I want, I love for everyone to try to get better. And I don't, I know it can be, it can, everyone can improve. It's just how, how much can we get out of everyone, right? Like in that way. And I I want to do it in a positive way. I don't want to do it in a, you know, mandatey, fascist, you know, authoritative way. It's I'm just wondering how we can all lift each other up, I guess. Mm. Yeah. In my own way, it's the the thought stream that you're serving up here of course in my own way like but is a core driver of my soul's work cuz the, the soul's work is not about me and it's not for me specifically the whole i think reason that there is a soul's work is because it's for humanity it's for the planet. It's for the the universe. Uh, so I've probably given a, a lot of thought to what you're serving up in terms of the solutions that I want to vision or the, the solutions that I, vi I am envisioning or see in the vision. especially seeing learning from the pitfalls of what doesn't work what sort of works therapy works but is it the most efficient is it the fastest does it need to be like there's a lot of big yeah. questions like i was asking myself all the the whole world that you're painting here with that with the i feel the question that you're getting at I think you understand it. I, I, yeah. It's hard to conceptualize even my question, but I think you're understanding what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, because you don't want to make too many assumptions, and you want to honor like the logic and and uh, understanding that Maslow's hierarchy of needs has has some uh, very good logic to it, and and it some and 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 it does have flaws. I, I want to be clear. Yeah. I'm very familiar with it with its flaws to it to its extent. And things are meant to be challenged, especially the society. What we have at our disposal now is totally different in terms of artificial intelligence is coming on board here. We're approaching a new level of abundance that the species has never known before, where this idea of survival can truly be prodded and tested in a, in a way. And, and I want to be very sensitive to the what you're what you're saying in terms of the means and and this is and I want to be clear that it's not this isn't victimhood this isn't out exactly. of um, this isn't out of poor anyone this is welcome to humanity if you are a soul put into a 
I'm just going to ex- let's extrapolate. Let's talk soul. Soul goes into pro- body. Body's born somewhere. Mm-hmm. We'll get into the soul stuff in a second. But please finish your point. I, I don't want to get too far because I'm I'm about to go. Oh. Yeah. oh, yeah, we can go. Yeah. So. For the last three to four years, I would consider that I was in R&D with my soul's work, with imagination technology, trying to figure out the puzzle of what it is, how to communicate the value of it, how to deliver it, and R&Ding all these different ways of doing it. And that has led to the passion company that we have today because the answer, not the answer, the solution that I am visioning with imagination technology, which is, man, I have a, the, the, the gentle way would be to say it's a compliment, complimentary, but on the non-gentle way, I could say it's a subversion of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Makes it, okay. It's really, Makes truly challenge our conscious evolutionary abilities and experimentation of what that means when you're putting yourself in the pilot seat of evolution and it's not an external force of nature happening to you. So I, I say this paralleling the gentle and ungentle. I'm 100% on board. I'm going to explain. Let me steel man you in a second, but go ahead and finish your concept, but I'll help steel man your, yeah. your argument. Yes, please. So the, the way that we're expressing this product, this uh, intellectual property, is looking at it in the terms of old evolution has gotten us very far. It has gotten us to this point. It has helped us survive. It has helped us know if there's a tiger around the corner ready to kill us. It has given us a lot of anxiety and stress because we're able to foresight and project all these possibilities. And because for yourselves. <laughs> exactly. And But it is old tech. It is old and antiquated, and we're bottlenecked. And what we're doing is... We're calling that the old operating system, natural selection or survival of the fittest. We're, we're, we're putting that it, in the it, container. Let, let's, let's do a minute. Uh, Maslow's would be working from uh, scarcity yep. and resource-based, and you're working from abundance. Is that and, basically, and, and is that basically yeah. the, the, lay, the lay way to explain that? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Man. Once again, German background, it like my dad's a hoarder because he literally had to hoard everything to survive. You know, it's like I know my cultural background and where that affects me in my direct way. Some things I can absolutely walk away from shake. Some things I just have this anchor to some old ideologies. And it's it's not even it's cultural something that I you know, we're all trying to shake. Right. And that that comes through understanding ourselves better. So. So let's go to soul. We'll, we'll go right into it because this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to ask a weird question, but did you have any physically traumatic experiences, injuries growing up? Any near like near death ex- accidents? Anything? Okay, so you lived your life therapy. Where did the soul part come in? Because it would have. It, it, it sounds to me like your soul and would have been, I don't, wouldn't say struggling, but your soul was yearning to be freed or uh, expressed or whatever. Yeah. And your corporeal self held it in check by your, you know, your cultural, your parents upbringing and this and that and the other and the way your brain chemistry works and how you interacted with children and all that. Yeah. What was your what was that moment, I guess, of of, of the soul and the I, I hate to say epiphany, but yeah, that connection. So when I go back to I was raised culturally Jewish and kind of forced to go to Hebrew school and have a bar mitzvah. 
But I had no. Joined, I went to many of those on my day. Oh yeah, they were every Saturday, every Saturday night. Yeah, party on the East Saturday. Coast. I know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I had no emotional connection to that faith or to God in general. Not, and and let's not kid ourselves. The Jewish the religion. Huh? Well, the Jewish religion isn't there. It, it's not a PR firm. Like the the Jewish people are, it's a cult. It is much different view than a Christian mm -hmm. would view their religion. I apologize for jumping in there, but like it, it is such a different. People don't even understand that Judaism is like a lifestyle, not a not. I, I don't want to criticize it as a religion because it is a religion, but it was like let's be honest, koshers. You're in the desert. Shellfish is probably the bad thing to eat in the desert. It's probably not good to eat it laying out. You know, yeah. makes sense. Cheese, uh, dairy, and meat not mixing a lot makes sense back then. That said, it still is a very important thing. It just wasn't sold like the Christians could sell it. They, they didn't make good T-shirts back then. Yeah. But anyway, well, so <laughs> yeah, so you yeah, so you grew so you grew up in that traditional, and I'm very familiar with that. And I I I I, 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 find, I find Ashkenazi the most anti-fragile of people. Mm -hmm. um, just. From all the struggle, literally cannot be defeated. Cannot be defeated on any scale. So, anyway, please continue. <laughs> uh, so, so religion was not part of it. You didn't connect to it, is what you're saying. All. Not at all. So, I, I was not atheist, but agnostic. Like, I just, I don't believe or not believe. I just need to see some proof here I, or to understand something. I'm. Yeah, but, just show me get, something. Yeah. Uh, it, then it wasn't until s spirituality came into the field for me that really kicked it up a notch of shifting the view towards consciousness and presence. I think one of the first books I read uh, was The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. I, I know it well. The yeah. flower, it does not start as a flower. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, like, oh, power of now, presence, not time, presence. And that it, see, like, turned on the seeker in me, right? Because then then you have somewhere to look. You, you, you have a direction, uh, spirit. Uh, so it was through that and trying to understand the mechanics of consciousness spirit and then oh soul like what is soul like just the curiosity right like that birthed the understand like attempting to understand something spiritual or or existential um yeah interesting i like that yeah i i had I'm the same way I was agnostic. I guess I would be agnostic, atheist, or whatever. I mean, I went, I grew up Lutheran, going to Sunday school. I remember them showing like a rapture movie, hmm. and it freaked me the hell out. Like, I ran home, oh my God, they're going to behead everybody. You're going to take the mark of the beast. Oh my God, we're all going to die. <laughs> I remember that. And I, I just remember like my, my aunt, uh, they worked on a farm. So they were, christians of course you know and it's like it nothing fit right with me and it's like what are you what are you doing and i was in i i, I don't want to say indoctrinated but i i like to sing so i would sing in the church with my cousin because we could sing a song so let's sing in harmony yeah it was religious based but i never really connect to religion in any way but i had a really bad car accident when i was 13 and my dad basically told me that angels saved me and that really messed with me because i just was like this is saving. This is saving. I'm, I'm in a full body cast here and I'm saved. You know, it was a tough thing. Uh, it got me very much away from religion. Wow. Don't, you know, more than just whatever. Had some, I have a friend who had a best friend who was uh, traumatized by the Catholic Church. I did a two part podcast on that. Happy to tell you how awful those people are. Because um, it's not, it's not really about. Uh, it's not about the system anymore. The people have allowed that system to continue showing its face and are still supporting it. It's not, it's past three strikes in my opinion. That's my opinion on that, but whatever. That said, I kind of went, I hate to say anti-religion, but I went anti-religion. And the best way to get out of having to argue about it was 
if a bush caught on fire in front of me and started talking to me, I'd pay attention. How about that? So um, I'm 40 years old, 40 or 41. And uh, my first, I'm, this is my rock bottom. I, uh, I understand that I do not want to get, go through this anymore. And it's not even ideations. It's just, I don't, I just, um, that, that was my rock bottom. I just don't, I'm done. I'm tired. So I went to see a guy who was an NLP therapist, a neuro-linguistic program, a little different than a traditional psychiatrist, psychologist. I'm not into medicine. It's not my thing. I don't want to be medicated. I've not taken anything. I met, uh, yeah, we'll talk about other stuff later, but I don't do that stuff. Um, then I had my burning bush moment, which really screwed me up. So I'm in my first meditation with this gentleman and I'm not a meditator to your point. The voices, first of all, the voices do not shut up the first 30 times you're trying to just be still right for like two minutes of quiet. Can you just get those voices to shut up? But uh, I'm going through my first meditation with this guy. It's like uh, he's walking me through. You're in a beach and you're picking up this stone and you look up in the sky and you see these pictures. And I saw the shooting in South Carolina the week before it happened. I saw a black man behind a podium in a suit, looks to shake to the right, looks to shake his hand to the left. And I see a pop. First thing I saw ever, never, ever experienced anything in that like that in my life. I've had a, I've had psychic experience prior to that, but never had a vision. So this happens on a on a third uh, was it on a Wednesday? It happened then the next Tuesday or whatever. I have a session with the guy. I don't even think I didn't connect the two. I didn't think anything of it. I just this guy puts me through a guided meditation and I go ninety degrees off to the right and I see death. And then I come back and it's exactly what I saw because there's a video of this gentleman six months prior to the shooting doing exactly what I saw in the vision that he had. Now, you've talked to me long enough to know how lucid I appear and how logical I would like to be. And I'm thrust into that world from science, logic, whatever, I'm thrust into a complete spiritual world without my understanding. Wow. And since then, it has not been pretty. And it's it's challenging to hone it because I don't think I I don't think I'm in control of those. So we can talk. We'll talk soul. We'll talk about that because it then leads to simulation, right? Simulation theory, right? It's like, are we internal, external? What are we, right? It gets. We can, we're going to go down some rabbit holes, and please feel free at any time to stop here. Uh, feel free to cut me off also. Um, but had that experience, had more experiences like that. And um, yeah, it's hard to shake. Uh, and I and literally the, the title of this podcast is that moment I was knocked conscious. Mm. And it wasn't the consciousness that I think most people would want if that makes sense. And it was not within my control. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. So since then, let me share a couple of experiences and maybe you can help me understand because I, I think we're supposed to be talking for, for real. Um, person, I'm driving down the street and a person passes me on the left-hand side. It's a little drizzly in Arizona and I'm like, Wow, that guy's really driving fast. First thing I think about, it. okay. I come up and it's like there's an external signal that pops in my head says, lay your foot off the gas. That guy's going to crash and he's going to fly in front of you. Just don't understand it. I just, so I'm with my girlfriend. I'm talking like, yeah, that guy's, that guy's going to be trouble. So I slow down maybe five miles an hour. We come around a bend and there's a pile up. Truck slows down, you know, slams brakes, comes across because he can't slow down and he, hit something not crazy but we completely avoided it and since these since i've been able to be conscious i guess and it doesn't happen all the time and it, it's never contextual and it's never exactly a moment like it could happen a day before without understanding it could happen a week before but it's generally close without context 
And these are the experiences I have. This isn't to tell you what I am or anything. I don't know. And ever since I'm, I'm talking real experiences that I can tell you from a lucid individual that if I didn't experience them, I would not believe you. All right. Does that make sense? Like I would not believe that I saw what I saw when I saw it. Um, so that was, those are types of things. Give you an example. I'm at, I'm at dinner and I'm eating and I look at my girlfriend. I'm like, I wouldn't eat this with a goat. I wouldn't eat this in a boat. And I start quoting Dr. Seuss, like just out of the blue, like what doesn't make sense, right? We drive home, come up to a red light. There's a car wanting to pull out. And it's two, it, you know how there's one like right, the next car, like the next one in front of the light that pull out. It was like two in front, but I'm like, I'll just stop and let the person out in front of me. There's, you know, there's nobody behind us, whatever. Guy turns or person turns in front of us, license plate D-R-S-E-U-S-S. Stickers just littered across the back. And and I sit there and I go, oh, that's what that was. I don't know why or how in the beginning, but there's no way that that's not connected. But the lucid part of me does not, cannot accept this connection. And I'll be honest, I can't step fully into that moment because I work with people who have things and I trust me, I can tell you this is real. This is. I, it's not scientific yet. To me, it's this is my analogy. If you went back in time and you had a Bic lighter and you went in front of a Neanderthal and you lit a Bic lighter, they'd either worship you or they'd stone you, right? Because you're either a god or the devil. They didn't understand what combustion on a on a butane lighter is. They don't understand that concept. This spirit stuff is we're just not there. We're just not under we don't understand it yet. But to your point the curiosity of understanding. And that's where the Einstein in you has to be. What are the mechanics of the universe? Because I cannot explain what I've physically seen and experienced, but they're real. And the more people hang around me, they're like, what the hell is that? And it's complete. And I can't, I can't meditate because I don't go into meditations. I literally go off into stories of things that happen. Last, I went to a meditation, a guided meditation with a person. I went to Sirius. I went to Sirius uh, B, the big blue ember burning, oh, whispered in my ear, home, boom. It's just absolute craziness. And then I get a guy who, who's a medical medium, and he touches my hands, and he freaks out, and he goes, you are, I can't handle you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, I can't handle you. And I'm like freaking out because I don't even know what that means. And he's like, oh, you're from Sirius just like me. And you're like, these things, I don't connect them. They are puzzle pieces that fit. And I, I do my best to not connect them. Mm. But when they fit the way they do, I question. Because I know that it's real. But this corporal, this corporeal part doesn't work with that part. Right to your point, the shift. There's a shift, and and I and I'm curious what where your soul journey is because that might help me understand mine a little better. Right. So so tell me this. You you became connected. How did you? Where where was that moment for you? I feel it comes down to when you have the awareness of what you were saying before about seeing beliefs as concrete, you're then given a choice whether you want to keep concrete and in a in you know slower thinking because of those heavy things or challenge the sense of concreteness uh, in how you were programmed conditioned trained to be a human civilian in life 
So what is the belief system shift at that point? Well, you're either seeing in limitation and scarcity and holding to a security and safety of concreteness and, and limitation. It, it is always, if you come from scarcity, you're coming from limited. It, it's just, they go hand in glove. Yeah, exactly. But then the other side of the choice that opens up that is less safe and secure, but also higher in frequency is everything is possible. That is open-mindedness to me. If your proposition, your, your main proposition is challenging concreteness, the other side of that coin is everything is possible. This is the imagination. This is um, op uh, an open mind. Everything is possible. If that is kind of the ground that you're starting from, then you see what is actually being defended in the old, which is fear-based. And because if everything is possible, it doesn't need to mean you need to believe it. It right. just means you're open-minded on possibilities to why would you want to rule anything out? Exactly. Your point. Exactly. And this is not because I think that's a good way to look at it too. Is like why not anything's possible? Like, don't tell me anything's possible. I know what can't be done. It's like, why rule anything out? Why why not be possible? Is yeah. the is just such a like a more collaborative way of looking at that. It's like, why, why not? Exactly. Why not? Yeah, I'm with you. And, so, and, and so I was going to say, if, if we're applying what you're saying, right, which is the, the discord or, or dissonance between rational thinking and spiritual, uh, dimensional, spiritual, existential stuff, well, now you're seeing like if everything is possible, then those are can either both coexist or one, you know, the, the the side that doesn't understand it can let go of the fear of it because everything is possible. So okay. Like right. there's an acceptance there. Well, you you're taking a quantum mindset. Like, let's be honest, anything that can happen must, not not could not whatever the probabilities are that every possibility you're going to turn left instead of right one day you're going to stand up instead of sit down you're going to do this instead of these are you know we can talk multiple dimensions we can talk timeline breaks we can talk quanta and this is the weird thing about it to me where i'm where quanta is such a weird thing where it defies time and space time is now under attack obviously um in this unique way uh but and i'm still understanding and all of these things, right? We we can talk about that. And and what I'm I've got this weird theory. I don't theory is not even the word, but this concept. I've seen what the bleep we know, but like obviously those are cultists. This is not, but we've we're able to transmit, I think, a bitmap image from one quanta to one from one particle to another via tunneling. So if let's just say, let's I'm just gonna conceptual, we're big bang. Big Bang happens. Everyone's technically, uh, what is that called? Uh, connected. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what are we? What do we call entangled? Mm -hmm. Everything would be entangled, wouldn't it? If technically it came from, even though eventually over stars became different matter, it still technically would be entangled. So, is that someone's a ability to tunnel into, say, someone else's memory, for example, and see this, or is it a quantum probabilistic method where it just sees? The way I kind of think about things is like when you tell me something, I see every answer and then I have to whittle it down to one. I don't. I do it very quickly, but it's like I know the things that are just aren't working and then boom, and it doesn't seem like that. But that's how I almost see everything, because to your point, everything is possible. 
So feel free to expound on on your thoughts on how, how on your thoughts on quantum in that way, or, or 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 what are your thoughts on quanta, or what are your thoughts on this? These things that I experience, you're nodding, but obviously this sounds it sounds absolutely crazy, and I'm with you. I don't understand what it is, but have you experienced those things in your search, for example, of spirituality? Or are we all shysters who make up shit in our head and we're like, oh, I saw that. And, you know, it, it's very possible. Both could be true. <laughs> are you saying specifically like spiritual visions or just. Uh... I feel like you've I feel like you've had experiences. I'm not asking you to to delve in them, but it feels to me what's what some things that are popping to me is like you, you've had some of these. You saw something that happened and it happened. And at one point you went, you know, I'm good with that when you weren't up to that point. And then at that point is when you, I would guess you exploded. Now I could be completely off here, but that's what I'm sensing from you. Hmm. Trying to, you, get... you can tell me I'm wrong, man. I don't, I don't take, I don't take offense to being hundred percent wrong. You don't have to play a politics. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, what I'm trying to get is, is feeling the, uh, what you're actually asking here. Oh. So I have a feeling that you had visions in the past. I've had feel as a highly sensitive empath. I think you've had some experiences yes. and it's your choice on whether you saw them as good or bad. I saw death. I don't know another way to see it. I don't see it as a way to another life. It's not like the death card in tarot. It's not, it's death. You know what I mean? It's literally not here. I've had, I've had past life regressions where I am not here. I yeah. can tell you I'm not here. I'm happy to share them. It makes me sound like an absolute insane person, but these things are absolutely in my soul registry of some sort. I don't know how to explain it, but they're there. Why do I see death versus the life, for example? And how would you think as one who is enlightened to an extent shift that perception without consciousness? Because I didn't consciously look for death. It yeah. threw itself at me too in a way that I can't even explain the feeling that I felt when it happened. I, you know what I'm saying? It, it was so visceral. It was absolutely yeah. a real experience. I feel because of my unique approach to this, I come from a, a very and the negativity that i mentioned before the negative worldview i have a strong uh i mean neurotic is the the encapsulate but the capsule of this but it's like skepticism cynicism and pessimism it's the the neurotic cocktail <laughs> that is the world that I'm coming from in approaching this. And the big picture way that I paint this is with the hemispheres of the brain, science, spirituality, and philosophy. Left brain, right brain, and the connection. Philosophy right. is how left brain talks to the right brain. So I come from the full left side over here. <laughs> where skepticism was my way of, of seeing everything right. cynical, pessimistic. I was very negative. So when I'm entertaining, everything is possible. The way that I see these things and, and experiment or get facilitated, you know, uh, did I do, I must've done a past life regression. I remember doing visualization, like, But for me, it's more, it's it's the Picasso quote. Everything you imagine, everything you can imagine is real. So when I come with my skeptic shoes on, yes, cool, I can visualize this and have this hat, like, but it's just my imagination. Plus minus, like positive and negative, but it, it kind of withhelds me from really getting lost in the rabbit holes because sure serve up whatever craziness you want to serve up everything is possible and everything i imagine is real cool yeah it's wild 
but I'm also I don't believe it. Like right. I, I right. Have that it is design. it is truly the Aristotle, you know, is the mark of an of an a curious mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. It's it's yeah. totally the same thing. We can work through concepts without having to adopt that you're what I you believe what I believe or think what I think at the end of this. These are just dabbles of of understanding that because I think it is out of my pessimism that I see the darkness before. Mm -hmm. Plus, obviously, darkness has a stronger path, all that stuff, right? It's just heavier. So, but my favorite quote: a, uh, "You got to die before you die to realize there is no death." There it is. Yes, that's exactly. That's a great way to do it. Um, and the thing is, I, I there was a point where I shifted. I got better, a lot better. But it didn't change some of the stuff I saw. And it, it was like, I thought if I changed how I felt, right, my perception, that the images would be different. And they were, they have not been, for example. Have and you, it's an interest. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just had a question come up. Like, these yeah. impressions that you've had, have you ever channeled them into art or anything no no not art um art i draw stick figure i don't have i let me put it this way i think like you you probably have a billion things you've done in your life i used to have acrylic paints i had an art art art, art uh, what's it architecture sketch thing i had the slide rule and i had this and that i have i've got this i've got every hobby mm -hmm. you, i'm still to your point, the passion, which we haven't even gotten to yet, which is amazing, but that is not, I have just a curious mind. It is not locked into one thing. I want to know everything and I want to get to know everything. And it really actually affects my relationships because I love meeting people, as I mentioned before, knowing them is, is like such a de deep level to the point where like, I'm, it's, it, the, the, the interest and curiosity of knowing who that person is. And that sounds awful. It sounds so cold hearted to me. And I don't get bored with people. It's not that it's just, they showed me something that ultimately is an impasse or something, right? It's not, and this isn't, I've got a very healthy romantic relationship. This isn't like I've worked all those emotional weird things out. I'm talking about how we work in this realm, I guess. Right. So if you could share any thoughts on that, that would be very helpful. <laughs> I mean, but a, po a podcast, long farm I podcast know. is. I know it's like I said. So let's go to passion. So yes. real simple passion. Yes. The gentleman on the British podcast. The second you mentioned passion, I went right to struggle. Passion of the Christ. I know what passion is. Passion is a very misunderstood concept, in my opinion, in today's world, because oh, I'm passionate about biking or I'm passionate about hiking. Well, when it gets hard, or if it rains out, you don't do it. Right. So that's not passion. The passion is truly what you're willing to struggle through to get to. Right. And even though my, I look at mine in a I, I haven't come to fruition with what I've done, my passion is like is suffering. It's seeing what I see in this weird way. And it's, it's understanding everything all at once. Mm -hmm. And I, you know what I mean? So that's why I overwhelm myself. And I would get, I would lend to that leads to anxiety and all those other pieces. So those things, those things you can work out with. How do we work with the core soul of our passion when I don't think that most people would be willing to struggle the way you struggled, having no job, having no whatever to get to your passion? Because really, it is struggle. The point of passion is, regardless of whether it's successful, you like it or whatever, you can't not do it, right? Icarus could not do anything but fly higher, mm -hmm. right? Um, what is, what's the guy, the guy who had to roll the boulder up the hill? That's, he had to do, right? That's the sto the whole object of stoicism and everything, right? So tell me about your philosophy on passion. I guess that would be the best way because... Maybe if you frame it from your mindset, other people can understand it that way and utilize it. Yeah, I'm going to actually challenge some terms here because okay, cool. I I understand the passion of the Christ and the actual dictionary definition of passion is is suffering. Um, 
but I'm I challenge that. I, I challenge would that you, because would you I, allow me to say passion is a calling? Would you like like a is that a is that a better better way of framing it? Calling is not intimate enough. I don't. It, it it's accurate. Well, there's a call, but you have to answer it too, right? So yeah, it, it's a two part part, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. why this is long format. You understand my initial statement needs a little nuance, right? Obviously, so let let's yes. nuance it. Yes, so, so. your thoughts. So, if we're starting on terms level here and getting out of the religious con preconception, oh yeah, and. Absolutely not. We're I'm literally talking about the definition of the Latin term passion. Yes. Meaning struggle. That's all. Yes. And and I'm not arguing that. I'm just gonna challenge what we're actually talking about because I didn't know uh what my passion was. I didn't know what passion was. Uh and approaching it like a scientist, what I discovered was yes passion is the most volatile emotion if we're going to call it an emotion it is the most volatile but then you ask like why why is because there, there's a reason why passion is termed in that suffering struggle well absolutely yeah yeah because you're pushing through that to through the struggle to achieve, I mean, in, in, in right? I mean, or is that not what you're doing? But let's just hang back a little bit with me right. here. Like, hang okay. back a little yeah, bit. Absolutely. To, see, to to give a little space, let, let's create a little cinema here where we're zooming out and looking at what something volatile is. Volatile is this. It, it's, it's chaos. It's uncontrollable unpredictable unpredictable that is volatile and because we're overtaken by it that's what makes it hard is because it is very very volatile but i believe with some understanding and new perception and evolution here what we're actually we got to ask ourselves what we're actually looking at when we're talking about something moving like this because to me in my like research into this and i put a lot of research into this not necessarily like traditional but no research into uh, we, we'll call you a deep thinker regardless of a book that you've cracked or whatever you think about these things Yes. So the more that I dove into spirituality and duality and non-duality or oneness in trying to understand that, the mechanics of like, oh, wait, the, it's duality is, is like good and bad, positive and negative. That's the contrast. But oneness is the presence. That's the singular. That's some somehow pointed at as the truth of things and when i take that into the into the realm of passion what i see is the closer you ride up your energy to a source prior to the split of the atom or the split of light into duality you're getting into light you're getting into a light consciousness light that is passion the closer the closest you can get to before a split your personal oneness mm -hmm. is that kind of a mm -hmm. once again i try to lay things out you know make what? lay terms but a personal oneness is is that passion yeah because you can be passionate in anger mm -hmm. or you can be passionate yes, you can. in excitement it is right. not a duality That's a good point okay now yeah and and I, I do conceptualize it slightly differently but that using that term of definition it definitely i can now yeah. it's just a word that now we have a 
good, once again, to your point, what are the three tenets? What was the first understanding? Uh, were the three? Grammar. This is where we're at, right? Now I understand your yes. road definition, or not road definition, but your um, experience definition of passion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is that point inside you that you that turns you on that yes. just right and it it's not in duality that's why when you're overcome and consumed by it it is hard because you can't control something that volatile it's right. aiming at a mastery here of right. like when you do master your passion and you, it becomes effortless well, you're it's upstream of the two voices telling you, fighting each other, telling you opposite pieces, telling you to stop, right? Like basically creating the noise that that gets in the way. If you can get to the highest point before it splits to that, now you don't have that conflict. You are at that point. Yes. And you're that wielding makes it. makes absolute and, sense. And so now, like when you look at this from a evolutionary uh, intelligence, human species improvement, We've got animals over here that don't really have emotions because that's humans are projecting that onto it, right? Yeah, absolutely. But like yeah. Emotions. Yeah. Correct. Then we've got humans here, and then we've got like AI and 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 tech coming over here. Passion is what makes humans humans. Animals don't have passion and and ro robots don't have passion. And when you take this like deeply in, in applying what I'm trying to convey here is passion is where humans have the conscious wielding of emotions. It is where we direct our emotions and inner power to be humans right it's what sets us apart and what is like in terms of visionariness what's going to be the conversation in the future it's not going to be about money because abundance and ai is going to provide so much more than what we're even con comprehend right now soul spirit passion those are going to be the new buzzwords of this future because humans are going to need their purpose amidst yeah this shift yeah okay so how do you the totally a left field it's a really bad question because it's really hard i think how do you trust yourself when you have when you found it i know you've had all this journaling but yours was a very long process and i think it is a long process for everyone i don't think you don't just back into this. I, I think it takes effort. First of all, it's there's sweat equity involved. But when, like, I'll give you an example. I have these things in me, and I I look at them, and they've happened, and they've happened before. And it's like when I have the next one, what compels me to share it or keep it to myself? And a lot of times, what I'm finding is in the weird quantum worlds, like I find when I share it, it may it probably has a higher likelihood of happening if I table it it's like it probably didn't happen here you know it's almost like i give it its own little smell test mm -hmm. what and it could be about any subject though it could be the most volatile thing or the most passive thing i might share the most volatile thing and it happens or the or not share the most passive thing like dropping a spoon and i don't or something you know very extremes it's not just based on one extreme mm -hmm. when i see smell feel this which how, how have you found to trust yourself in a way when you get an in because i would assume highly sensitive inputs all day how do you trust when your input matches something that you're thinking output how do you go this is right this smells right to me i'm going to take it like the vaccine you mentioned didn't feel something didn't feel right felt the same way and i and i'm telling you i feel like you would have had challenges just from what i'm sensing it's just mm -hmm. one of those things Uh, I'll bounce back with a question. Yeah, as Please, no. Yeah. Don't make me talk anymore. I talk too uh, much. It, well, it, uh, or more for the audience. Uh, asking yourself, well, what are you trusting? When you say, 
How do you how do you trust yourself? Well, what are you trusting? What is the self? Where is the self? That you take you take a few beats to to submerge into that curiosity. Now we're getting the ego here. De- or deeper. I mean, yeah, yeah, deep. Well, deeper for sure. Yes, yeah. ego, the, the self. self. Yeah, right. Well, when I say trust myself, is let me once again nuance. Right, we are yeah. in a nuance. So, I have a vision. What's me to think it's real here, and to share or to not share? You have ideas that come in. What is your filter for? And and I generally talk about ones you're like, man, I could see somebody really thinking that's out there, but it feels right to me and I think I'm going to follow that or pursue that, right? Yeah. In intuition, I guess. In yeah. Terms. I think it's it's always context. The When I learned that in, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with human design. Um, a little bit. A little bit, but I, I learned that I'm meant to like more respond. And so once I learned that, like, oh, I don't have to be the one that's coming up with I'm best designed to respond like this. Oh, that okay. was like, oh, that makes. I feel so like you're an innovator, though. You're not a. I feel like you are a creator, but you're a creator in a counterpunch way, like in a. You see a need, like in that way, in a responsive yeah, way. Well, this saying. is what I mean by by context, like the you know certain contexts. Yes, it's so much better for me to respond because for sure. that's when I get activated. Well, context changes the content for sure. It's like if you're being attacked, obviously the best thing to do is fight fend you off right? right versus you're not generally an aggressive person but in this case it would make sense yeah but when we're talking about okay the, i guess there's different i'm a context but then we're talking like different phases of an idea is what i see here because when you have a baby of an idea that you know you listen to david lynch talk about like ideas from the from the ether you have to it's you have to incubate and if you talk to someone too early especially a negative person and you share it it's gonna you'll it'll wipe it out so quickly and it's it's it'll be gone so So do you find yourself keeping ideas to yourself more than sharing until you get it to a uh what's that that's what i've learned thermal whatever that past the point of no return kind of to have yeah people that i know i can trust to Yes, and me. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, know, you need it, it helps. Yeah, I'll tell. Like, I'll have those people right where where I know it's safe for this baby, uh, but then it becomes more like driven to be expressed when it's time when the timing is right. It'll be called. It'll be called upon. It, I'll get the me- like. I'll get the message. Like, okay, we got to start talking about it. It's ready. Yeah. It's got a foundation. It's got systems. It's got operate. It's the idea. It's ready. Like, it's out saying. of the out of the oven, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that, that's, that's a good. That's a good way. There on, on. And then you probably even introduce it to critics, knowing that it's complete because you need to tweak it, right? So you're the type of person who would actually take it break it for me and show me where I can make it better. I'm sure that seems like you versus this is my baby. How dare you call out my baby? This is mine. Yeah, I like that. It's a good full circle way to to do that. So your 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 passion. Tell us about your new your newest thing. I know it's getting late. I'm I could talk for days and hours. Um, you know, I like I said, I I I find I find it interesting. And I'm grateful for the conversation. I find you extremely thoughtful. You've come to places that I have a hard time getting to because some of my visions have not have been the reality of of not that regardless of what I want. So it's been challenging in that way for me. Once again, this is what they what it is. I just try to navigate, right? Um, This isn't critical. This is observational only. I went on your website. Every review is feminine. Mm -hmm. You're a spiritual minded guy. Is, is do you correlate the the reviews? Would you say your audio? Would you say your your uh, clients are more feminine based? Even if it's more in a Gaia motherly way, it doesn't have to be a woman, right? It can be a feminine energy. I have a feminine energy inside of me that screams that was non-existent and tampered down for many years prior to that. Mm-hmm. 
how how would you correlate that uh you know that either the you know i like i said you see a lot of females on on your on your uh website is that because of the energy and the, the way that you think it's accepted or what are your thoughts on that and it's not to criticize please understand i'm not trying i don't have a i don't have a i i, I an agenda i'm just curious yeah, yeah I, I i love it the because i think men need help to yeah be completely honest not not that men are bad i don't think it's not a misogynist thing men suck and men need help like we do yeah and i don't there's a lot of ways to break that down but you know. yeah if i'm if i first off i feel like women are more open to feelings in general like i think that's uh that's a given like that's that's the that's the surface of this i think that's a delay of the comic book and the men like mental health it was a delayed yeah. thing and in men it's suppressed absolutely exactly first thing that comes to mind but i think you have a deeper idea to it as well yeah when i when i plumb deeper into this and i, and I take my you know struggle with communication and and things like that it's a calling for me in response. It, it, it's definitely a calling for me to step it up a little bit more to communicate from more of my uh, masculine energy. And I can see where I've held back in where I've come from in in feeling invisible and, and more sensitive and, and kind of more so in that feminine energy. It makes sense that I've attracted more clients that are, I let, not to say that I haven't worked with men, uh, but you're raising a great point because I think there is a better job that I can do as a as a founder, as a as the inventor, as uh, the CEO to communicate more powerfully. Um, not to say that I am bad. I think I've gotten a lot better, but I think I can I can get better um, to we really all, we reach. All can improve. Uh, to really reach and 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 connect on that level with with more guys that like you're saying that need some support but also are suppressed from asking for help because i know that like that's the yeah. wall because on on one level of marketing you're having to reach a target audience that is ready uh for what you're <laughs> selling right, right. So you have to have the the bullseye kind of be yeah you got to be ready for this but you know and that's luck term, let's, let's, we want we need to you you can be as predictive as you want but that specific moment that shift of any takeoff of any that there is a luck aspect to that on almost every case and to not incorporate that that is not to say everyone you set to your point you set everything up so the luck is the smallest portion of the outcome yeah. but there's always a thing like the timing it is so much timing where a con I, I use an example bosom buddies is one of my one of the comedies growing up with tom hanks and it was about two guys who yeah it was literally one season or two seasons early 80s tom hanks and peter scolari they cross-dressed because they needed to live it for cheap rent so they dress as women and lived at the susan b anthony apartments in new york city okay. so literally this is two men dress as women who get away with it they're best friends with the girlfriends that they have like you know like as girls they're best friends with them and then as you know they're like boyfriend and girlfriend when they're not dressed up as women and it's like it was this just ahead of its time thought right it's just kind of, it was a timing thing five years later ten years later that thing is tom hanks isn't doing movies because he's a tv star he's a seinfeld you know what i mean but because he it was ahead it was just misplaced time wise it just didn't take off to that extent where the idea was good where do you it is yours more the preparation of the time like i know it's solid idea i've gone through my testing or do you have an intuition aspect where maybe this isn't ready i should still bring it out to the world a little earlier or maybe i should hold on even though it's ready we're uh, we're definitely in the like early access uh we're we're releasing in december like that's that's congratulations yeah 
And then, you know, we want to build up some some steam for like an official launch, maybe sometime next year. Um, what I've learned in my entrepreneurial uh, journey uh, that I've really taken to to this in a new in a really cool way is I used to be very rushed uh, and rush things and try to do things super fast without actually feeling into what it actually needs. And with this, we're really, really indulging in the patience to do it right and to do it very deliberately in an unrushed way. Um, and that has really allowed me to immerse in some of the details of uh, communication and marketing that for my own evolution needed to happen uh, so, so that it can both have its own voice and that I could represent it. Um, and and that's kind of where we're meeting right now is like it's early access. It's for those like early adopters that love new tech uh, mentality. That's me. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. Because this, this what, what we're doing is, is sort of very much outside the box. There's nothing else uh, like it in personal development. Uh, and so we know that uh, it's not going to be for everyone um, as we really, you know, get it out there. Very nice. Yeah. Do you have a general overview just to kind of give it a general idea of what it is and what it does? And Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of started it earlier when I kind of painted the A side of, of natural selection and survival of the fittest as the old operating system. Correct. That is the old operating system from scarcity, fear. Exactly. Taking, mm -hmm. conquering, all that, and and self-conscious. So, what we have with imagination technology is a new operating system for the human mind, for the human species, to accelerate the shift in consciousness and to give people and this is connecting i love how it's all connecting back full circle where we were talking about kind of a different view on maslow's pyramid like how can we you know use technology to accelerate and kind of flip things on its axis so our product iself is the way that we deliver and and kind of support this shift in operating system uh to our uh, to to our users our customers um who want the fastest and most effective way of healing freedom and mastery that's that's the 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 big picture of of what i consider personal development um and conscious evolution from survival of the fittest natural selection these are not conscious these are victim Right, like, yeah. like you were saying for these well, are cause and effect. Right, they're literal, just they're processes. Right, they're biological processes. Really, they're they're not yeah, thinking. No. They're just what propagates. Right. Yeah. So for those that are already on the personal development bend, uh, especially it's for them, right, because they already have to speak the language of this, but they want to have a hand in their transformation and really steer this conscious evolution, because it's a brand new opportunity to the human species. We've never had this before. And so for those that want to learn how to do it um, and to have the, the support along the way to, to this isn't just information uh, adding onto your plate. This is, a, this is a whole new operating system underlying the body, mind, spirit connection from the big picture. This is imagination technology, not information technology. Uh, it's a whole new uh, way of, of, of being uh, that is more natural uh, to how we operate and not artificial. I, that's beautiful. That sounds great. I'm on board. So how do we sign up? Do we just go, go on? Website? Yep. The passion imagination company. technology dot org. Uh, the passion com? company dot org is, is oh, the company. Passion company. Yeah, the passion cup, but it is a redirect. I thought, I thought it went somewhere. I, I apologize. Let me type it in. Anyway, so I, it's it's a beautiful thing, and 
I love the way you're doing that. You're you're coming from the abundance mindset. And we're finding in entertainment, for example, comedy is a good one, right? With the Joe, the explosion of Joe Rogan and his open armed, open mindedness to just inviting everyone to say and to express. Mm -hmm. Look at his community, what he's developed in Austin, for example. People are flocking to him in, and he's not asking for this. You know, he's not, and it's not like he's being some savior or anything. It's not like he's playing that. But it is interesting how people, you know, either vilify or deify, right? They're, yes. they're people and how he, but his came from the abundance mindset. It's such yeah. a bigger way to look at it. It's like, there's plenty of comedy going around. There's no longer three television stations, right? Exactly. There's no longer cable fighting. It is out there. Exactly. And it's just one, I'm just wondering if, once again, we have Pareto, we have the Pareto principle, 80-20. We've got the Price's Law, the square root of the employees uh, does 50% of the work. We've got these two really big laws in place. And regardless of how we spread out that wealth, do you see the natural laws of Pareto and Price possibly still becoming a thing? And can we live in the 20% as the 20%? Once again, I'm asking... I'm asking for because I need we need to shift from where I where the people are thinking where they live right they live in this muck and mire of the reality of scarcity and fear because that's what's fed to them yep. that is what the news is that is what the, the gas crisis and the food everything is fed into our fear right where you know I don't it's like how do we you know how do we get that reprogramming done right it's like do we do we just trust that we'll be the 80, we'll be the 20% that have the 80% or are we, you know what I mean? Are you familiar with Pareto principle? And, and uh, like that? I mean, I, I've got the gist of it from what you, what you so, said. So basically the Pareto, the Pareto principle basically tells you regard over all laws and all over nature, it's kind of like how it is now. 80% of the wealth is owned by 20% of the people, right? It's like, it's like this 80, 20 rule of 80% of the X is, it's the 20% that have, you know, 80% of your time is with the 20% of people that you're trying to sell, but 20% of your time is the 80% of the real foundational money because you've generated that concept. Does that make sense, Pareto? Yeah. yeah. It seems to be a law that will, over time, work itself out. Yeah. Do we think we can consciously overcome the 80-20? Because at Limitless, I guess 80% of Limitless is Limitless. And 20% of limitless. So I guess maybe the bigger question is how do we get out of the comparison mindset? The comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And I guess that's where I was coming with. And, and this is why I have to do these types of conversations because I just found out my question trying to figure out how to ask it, right? So now, how, how do we, because comparison is that, right? We do compare against our person. So if they get one more like or click or one more follow or this or that, there is a non-even dispersion of that outcome, regardless of the abundance. Yeah. So my guiding star for a uh, vision is Star Trek, because when if we're going to the far, far, far future that that show presented or Broddenberry crafted, what you're seeing there is the the idea that if we can materialize any material from nothing, there is no more scarcity and no more need for money. I'm not saying we're there now, but I'm saying that we're building a bridge to that. That stuff's mm -hmm. coming. I don't know how fast, but if that's the pre presupposition, but uh, proposition presupposition that we're heading there where we can materialize things out of nothing, any material, and then a holodeck that can do any anything for us, like any environment and scene. Well, then if we take that in, we're actually just retuning what wealth is on a consciousness level, not a material level. That's all that we, that's all, that's all that we really need to shift because once you discover your true wealth, in a in a consciousness sense the material wealth really doesn't hold a candle to that and you're closer to the limitlessness at that point and then those laws don't really matter 
because you're not doing the comparison thing. It, it's not about that anymore. Okay. Using that as an example, this is where my individuality comes in. Once again, coming from tyranny and oppression and understanding the sovereign of the individual. Yes. Why this, please take this with the grain of salt that I throw it. Why would I want to be part of a federation that tells us that we're free, but really controls what we do and how we do it? Because it's not really a freedom thing. Because they're they're you're being monitored. Like let's not kid ourselves. It's we're we're thinking Star Trek, but we're living 1984. Sure. Okay. So once again, the you and I, we can be as visionary as we want. And when you become the power, the Bill Gates who does what he does and is the evil that he is, right? Not the good that he is, right? You under. Please understand, I have an ideology or I come from a side, okay? <laughs> it's very simple to see the evil that he is. I know Elon, obviously, the guy has responsibilities that I couldn't even fathom to grasp the effect of what his, one of his decisions does to 50,000 people. I, I, I've never been there, so I don't have that luxury. Uh, I don't, I, or the ability, no, I don't want it. Let's not, I'm not going to kid myself. I don't want that. I don't have that ability, but I fight that at all times. And I, I find Elon refreshing in a lot of ways. We can obviously agree that he's more open than any other billionaire out there. And, I, and it's not critical of people who make their life, right? I'm like, I'm all for that. It concerns me with that yielding of power and how that can become authoritative versus freeing because in your vision absolutely freeing but bill gates isn't living the freeing version his his farms produce all the fries for mcdonald's he owns the biggest portion of land he's going from vaccinations to nasal spray he makes a half a billion dollars saying the vaccine's good and then shits on it after he dumps the stock he actually shits on elon for tesla which i love because that, elon's like thank you i'm good i don't need you because he doesn't need him okay Good is good and good, whatever, and and I love that. But there's a point where that that type of consolidated power can be challenging, right? Versus where it seems free, but it's not free. Does that make sense? Just because you're afforded well, everything doesn't mean you're free. At at what point uh, are you saying? What do you mean by consolidated power? Well, like the the federation. I, I can go back to governments, right? We're we're going we're moving to a digital currency. We're yeah, moving to CBDC, and and they're adding, for example, carbon footprints to this digital piece, where they're telling you you have an X amount of allotment. You can do anything you want, but this percentage goes here, that percentage goes there, and with that, and you cannot get outside of that. That's not the freedom that I recall. Me going outside and making the choice to ride my bike and get it falling off the bike and scuffing my knee. Like, they don't even let you get there. I know it's a big picture question, but it's like, with that level of ability to get that, someone's managing that, correct? And at what point does the altruism no longer become altruistic? Because the, our government has to do things to protect our sovereignty, and they're probably not good things, right? There probably has to be war to some extent, and there has to be some defense or something, some idea, some policies placed to protect something, and it creates another problem over here, right? I've always been just like, we, we should have our communities and be as free within those communities, but even within the guise of a larger policy, once again, I don't even know what I'm asking, to be honest. Yeah. I'm just asking. I think the visionaries see altruism in everyone, and I haven't experienced altruism from those who have the ability to give altruism. Yeah. Does that does that kind of make sense? I mean, is that a weird way to say that, to ask yeah. that? What's coming up is... And I apologize for my frantic thought on it i'm I, I'm, I'm trying to work it out in a in a in a pot in a correct question that's yeah. constructive because this isn't a bitch fest i i this has been highly entertaining very i'm just grateful for the conversation because you you explain some very beautiful concepts that i need to listen through and and really work on adopting 
in that way. I I just seem to find that the altruist, the visionary who is, becomes the tyr- ty- tyrannical person who isn't. Mm. Mm. And only when one can become to that critical mass of not being affected by, right? Like the one who can make the push the buttons. The visionary is not the powerful until they can control yeah. all the things, right? I know that's deep, man. I'm, and yeah. I apologize it's so late. So if that's well, something we table for another day. <laughs> I, well, let me, I, let, me, let me respond. Like I, I yeah. have some things coming up here. Because when I lens this from evolutionary terms, because what you're bringing up are are closer to us and the the remnants that are left over. But the more mass of people that are consciously evolving and know their freedom on the inside is going to reflect itself on the outside in terms of the world that we're producing creating and projecting on the outside it's the best way that a change you want to see in the world kind of i mean you know in the yeah and the best way that i could put it is like when people clean their inner climate the ramifications will be the earth's climate it's not the other way around that's where people are getting confused so the more people that yeah it's, it's the clean your room in a weird way clean your room aspect right go inward and if you keep your stuff straight, obviously, and everyone does that, then outwardly it will yeah. become. Then th- all these things that are stemmed from fear are going to fall away in yeah. evolutionary terms. They they will be antiquated the more that people are aware of the choice there. And that is a, such a visionary mindset. It is, it's a thing that you get to. And it's funny because I've, I've sprung to that, but I've reverted I, I, you know, you go, I come, I go back and forth and it's, I personally, uh, I, I had an okay position at a company and I'm making about half of what I used to make because I want no leadership. I want none of that. I know the reason that is in me is I have an anti-authoritarian mindset from a bunch of things, but the big, (laughs) The biggest the biggest part of it is like I think I would be the tyranny that I see in others when I criticize power. And it's always my concern that I will become the evil. And I hate to say evil because it just sounds like but there's a combative relationship, right? You work in wrestling. Manager has a combative relationship with an employee, right? But they are a yes person to the owner, but I'm not a yes person to anyone. So it's like you play that constant dance of, I think I would be very authoritative as a manager. Like I wouldn't put up with guff because that would be my style, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't work well with others. But that's not, that's not how it would work in my house because this, it worked the way I'd want it to be run, if that makes sense. Right. So knowing all these things in myself, I've actually held myself back from leadership and authority and, and those positions for my own personal fear that I would become I wouldn't be altruistic anymore. Like how much for, I can do a podcast because we can talk concepts and this doesn't hurt anyone ultimately if someone can listen to it, take it and not take it. But if I do something, you know, oh, sorry, good. I was gonna ask uh, so I could be on terms with you. What is the difference between altruistic and authoritative? Well, altruistic would be doing something, okay, authoritative where altruism becomes authoritative is when i think that i we need to do something for the betterment of all that's my altruism but it conflicts with your actually being better for you because it's not better for you or a percentage of people that's where it becomes authoritative right we can use covid uh it was altruistic so you wouldn't kill your grandmother to get the shot it became authoritative when people were getting fired for not getting the covid shot even though they been exposed and been frontline workers that we applaud this whole time who have gone through twice, you know, haven't gotten it twice and are completely have natural immunity, for example. Right. That that altruism of saving your grandma, which is the narrative from the from, by the way, the the visionary, by the way, the visionary RMA or mRNA technology. Once again, I believe in, in visionaries. That's not the ideas of the stuff. It's how we use them that I'm having problems with. Those visionaries aren't 
using misusing that to become authoritative mm -hmm. that that is where altruism becomes authoritative i don't know it you don't see it in star trek because they never addressed it but there's got to be people who are not doing anything and you're like why are you not doing anything with everything allotted to you right and i'm sure there's somebody coming down on them in some way going you're not living up to your federation duties mm -hmm. I, I, I we never talk about it because that's not what the concept of the show is right? right right but let's be honest it's great to be on a on a honeymoon but when you get back from the honeymoon it's the reality hits it's a different right it's different do you this feel isn't critical. This is just looking at the full pictures. I want to be clear that I'm trying not to be negative, but I am being negative. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we, we need to represent all the sides to have a healthy conversation. Do you feel that there is such a power that is neither authoritative or altruistic? No. And I think that's what it is. I think there we should always have checks and balances at all times on all costs on all sides right like i i fear that at some point you see uh, with the sovereign of the individual no one 100 is going to be happy government has to have authority there have to be laws in place right even if you don't like the law it's there for some purpose correct when we get to the point of altruism we want to help others by forcing that help on others, it can be a big detriment to the people who don't want it forced upon them. Right. And that's all I'm simply saying is if we need, if we are to recognize the sovereignty of the individual, it's almost like this overall arching thing is practically impossible other than for the guys of society, right? Like we need to live together. And those are the concepts I think about and i don't know if there are answers because they are probably out they're probably from the scarcity mindset but we're not at the abundance mindset yet mm -hmm. well i think the the nuance like i know you brought up the entity of the government and that, that wasn't really the nuance of my question my question is more towards the individual is uh, okay is, is there such a power that is neither altruistic or authoritative Like, are, use lay terms, are there non-player characters in the world? Yeah, yeah, there are a few, but I would say most people want to help. And even if they want to help, some people want to tell you how to do it. So you could have altruism and authoritative. You can have authoritative without it. You can have altruism without the authoritative part. Where I just want for everybody. So there's, I, I think there's a balance, right? I don't know if those are... The binary pieces that we're talking about that's not the one or the zero but mm. it's close right i think to your point it's, it is a little bit close that we're kind of getting mm. there but you ask a very good question i would have to say okay i always have a thought initially compel me to change my mind i would say no everyone has a percentage of both throughout their body whether it's like i want to help people but i also tell people how to help like baby, I, I, I want you to feel good in the morning. So you know what you need to do? You need to do this so you feel good in the morning. It's like that. That No, she needs to do what she what makes her feel good in the morning, not what I think, right? That's the authoritative part. Versus the altruism is I want I want her to feel good in the morning. Mm. Right? The, the authoritative becomes a how. Right, right. Interesting. And yeah. when you, in, when you impose an altruistic feeling on a sovereign individual who doesn't feel that yeah it's no longer an altruistic act and i this is just reality this isn't right this is there's gonna be one out of 7.8 billion people that are gonna not agree right like regardless of any topic so these are the things where i try the, your oneness maybe that's the thing i'm trying to get the one of 7.8 billion and that guy from seven i want i'm trying to get everybody into the to the fold how do we all buy in without it be really being buying in i guess mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it's the core of it mm -hmm. i guess right? in my in that in that thing so uh, final thoughts i i i talk too much talk more please help me out here <laughs> oh. 
I, I think, I mean, just to put a bow on it, like we're, we're coming at it from different angles, but at the heart, I, I feel we're talking about inner power. Um, inner, like, I think if it, if we're not getting lost in the complexities of application of power, but more directing people to it so that they can have the freedom to have it, uh, that in the altruistic sense feels much better than people not having freedom. Yes. So absolutely. I think we're talking all the ways around just where is our inner power? What is it to passion? And how can we consciously evolve to uh, to, to shift into that consciousness um, or have a whole new operating system to play with? <laughs> I love it. So yeah. you so your concept is to basically introduce people to through workshops and such to collaborate to gain this inner power. How is that? How Actually, you do it, or it's it's much more simple than that. We've got a um, a little course program that has like five videos. That's all you need uh, to to really grasp and start to play uh, with it. And then we've got a help desk uh, tech support for the soul that is there to uh, help you install it, like to run it uh, and to take it into application. Because uh, that's where a lot of personal development doesn't quite do it is how do you apply yeah that's what i really wanted to focus on with this is, is giving people something to really play with specifically right and and i, I would not call your thing like a self-help thing that that that's doing it injustice but in that vein of helping oneself exactly the concepts do nothing without applic without finding a finding a way for it to apply to you yeah, self specifically because every Not yeah, <laughs> perfect. That's a great way to put it. So yeah, well, if you have any other concepts, anything I said that you that pops some thoughts in your head that you'd like to close before we call it a day, I I'm more than grateful. I mean, it's been three and a half hours. It's like a time warp to me. I it's like I just Fairly. sat down with you, Jeremy. Thank you so much for your time. I, I'm more than grateful. I thank you for having me and facilitating like such a. Uh, wide breadth of I don't think I've ever had such a wide breadth of conversation on a podcast before uh all the topics pro wrestling cinema we haven't we haven't scratched the surface man. quantum yeah so I, if you ever want me back and want to do another marathon I'm I'm absolutely always... <laughs> all right well it sounds great lad I actually reached out to uh the person who contacted us I'm like hey if you have a story you want to share uh that person didn't mention anything about coming back but it's okay I'll leave it open as well um yeah. You know some people I'd love to talk to. Feel free to, if this had any value of anyone to anyone, I am trying to do something with this. I'm not going to lie. If I don't ask, I wouldn't know. So you obviously know what I'm implying. Uh, feel free to put my name out to people who want to talk to me for four hours about anything, because I will yeah. literally talk about anything. I pretty much have it to ZZ Top, my friend. Um, Jeremy, uh, Instant Connection, thank you so much. I... Am I? I am. I don't know how to explain it. It's like I'm. I'm in awe of the visionary you have, and the the ability and lack of visionary I have in me in the weird way and what I'm fighting myself to do. For example, because I am in the older school of we really didn't understand ourselves. You didn't understand yourselves. I didn't understand 15 years prior to you. There's that. that's a whole generation, a whole family of people. I mean, people having kids at 15. So that's a whole nother family generation of, of issues that we deal with that we try, maybe that extra layer that we try to break through. But the visionary is, I just admire that. So for all my shitting on the negatives, because that's what I, I only want to fix the things that are broken. I don't want to fix the things that work, right? Um, I admire you and I'm just grateful for the time that you that you've offered. Mm -hmm. So closing comments, please share everything you want. You have you have the floor. Mm. Well, I think I'll I'll close it off with a little bit of uh, of a tease that 
speaking of, of bring it back all the way around to knocked conscious, I want to want to just put a put a little little emphasis on there's a lot out there in terms of information uh, to improve yourself that is going to blow your mind. Let's let, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Well, tons of shit out there that is going to blow your mind. But if you truly are interested in having your mind broken, uh, please contact me, uh, request an invite uh, to iSelf, uh, powered by Imagination Technology, because, yeah, it's the difference between having your mind blown and having your mind broken. And that's what you need to truly consciously evolve. Can't sell it better than that. Last question. Are Do you plan to document the journeys of individuals doing it almost like having a film crew follow them? Yes. Have you thought about them? Look at yeah, that. for those that See, that's get, where my vision. See, I already go into like figuing yeah. out you would. For those that's that get what I permission, okay. for, uh, that's 100%. so cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, good. Really good luck, and that's launching very soon. We don't have a date yet, but you have that coming up. Um, please feel free to email me all your information. I'll put it all in the bottom of the YouTube video. I'll have it on both audio and video versions. So okay, let me, I'm gonna put that here. Thank you again. I am once again. I'm just grateful, and that anyone takes steps like just takes chances like you do. I had always come from a scarcity mindset my i i own my own house i have a property i'm grateful for everything i have but it is even without what i have and own it's scarce it's still not abundant you know in the large scheme of things so i'm grateful for you having a an idea that allows for that abundance to spring forth mm. so soul's work Thank you again, man. Uh, cool. Maybe we can connect again in the future. Like I said, please feel free to pass my information to people who I'd like to talk to. So, But um, thank you again. Jeremy, it's been a pleasure. Welcome to Knocked Conscious. I'm glad that it resonated with you. It certainly, your your uh, journey certainly resonates with me. So Loved it. Had, a, had so much fun. See you soon. Thank you again. Have a great day. Take care. Bye.